three years. It was a brainstorm by Dr. Frank Kaufman, a couple phone calls, and the ball started rolling. This is, uh, we've actually had events in Southern California for three years. This is about the fifth or fourth event, fourth event, but this is the first time that this content is being, uh, being shared and being rolled out. So we're very excited that you're here. We're actually honored that you're here. We know that you've come a long distance. We know that on a Saturday you could be doing a lot of other things today, but we know that you're all Everybody that's come here are patriots, and you're concerned about our country and the direction our country is going. Yes. Agree? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So we're going to get started. Uh, what I'm going to ask everyone to do is if you, first of all, let me uh, turn that off. Um, we're going to have an invocation, start with an invocation, coming all the way from the Bay Area. Reverend Kevin Thompson is going to offer our invocation. Can we all stand, please? I wasn't born in America, but I got here as quick as I could. <laughs> yeah. As far ahead. Our loving God, our heavenly parent, we pray for your mercy upon this nation of America, which you've blessed so much. We pray in repentance for misusing our blessings and living frivolously. I pray that we can rediscover the trust in you and embrace your divine will for this nation. We pray to fix what is broken and restore what has been lost in America. And we pray that America can heal the divisions in this nation. We know that no divided kingdom can stand. Our prayer is for divine inspiration for our leaders so that they can model the way out of the mess we find ourselves in. Furthermore, I pray that our churches and religious institutions can model and demonstrate unity. I pray that we can remember the foundations of this nation being family, church, and then government, not the other way around. Yeah. As the families of America go, so will go the nation. This nation is in crisis only when we step out of line of your blessings. There's no crisis if we stay within your truth and your blessing. I pray that America will be aflame with righteousness and be of sacrificial service to the poorer nations of the world and that we can share all of the blessings that we have. We pray for integrity for our leaders that they may resist temptation and corruption. Above all else, we pray for redemption, peace and prosperity for this nation of America and all nations of the world. Our prayer is that you can really be one nation under God. May thy will be done. Please accept our humble prayer in the name of our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you, Reverend Thompson. Now, uh, if you could remain standing, we're going to um, pledge of allegiance. Okay. We're going to have the pledge of allegiance. You can all join. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Remain standing one more. Uh, Rebecca, we're going to have a very special uh, national anthem. How would you like that? Oh, wow. Yes. We're going to start with the national anthem. Can you 
that our flag was still there. Oh, say does the star spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you very much, Rebecca Zinke. Very much. Okay, next, um, I would like to invite. A, oh, you can all have a seat. We're not going to stand for the whole three hours. Uh, I would like to. Invite, I would like to invite up another very important person to this event. Um, you all, a lot of you probably already know him already. And that is Jack Ashworth. Yeah. And Jack. Yay. Let me just say a couple things. Without Jack, I don't think we'd all be here today. Jack is a, he is a, he is a powerhouse. Um, and Jack has a, an educational background. He worked for several decades in the Los Angeles School District um, as a special ed teacher. Uh, Jack's retired, but he came back out of retirement to be the chairman of the Southern California Settlement Project. So I'd like to welcome up Jack Ashworth. That's here. Uh, it's my honor to introduce, uh, to introduce our distinguished scholars who will be giving presentations today. Um, both of them, uh, you might need, need to know this, come from extremely different academic um, disciplines. So we hope that they don't get in a fight here today. <laughs> but um, I would like to just introduce a little bit about them. Um, our first speaker, David Burgess, he uh, received his Master's of Arts in International Studies and Comparative Religion and his PhD in Critical Theory from the University of Washington. Dr. Burgess serves as founder, founding literature and politics editor at the New World Encyclopedia since 2005. Dr. Burgess leads and has led several national and international organizations involved in social and political leadership, education, and mobilization committed to interracial and intergenerational harmony and collaboration. Dr. Burgess currently advises the Settlement Project and its new American initiative in areas of philosophy, ideology, and the Academy. Our second producer, our speaker, uh, Dr. Frank Kaufman, received his PhD in History of Christian Thought at Vanderbilt University. He comes from a long history of international, or his activities uh, have a long history of international peace leadership from a background in scholarly activism. In the latter arena, he is the founding director and editor-in-chief of the Wikipedia alternative, New World Encyclopedia. Dr. Kaufman's experiences in areas of war, in the forefront of digital research, led him to realize that a free and healthy future for all depends on American patriots turning back current forces hostile to America's founding ideals. Dr. Kaufman founded the Settlement Project in 2020 in response to a spike in clear and open attacks on America, especially from within. Dr. Kaufman, through the Settlement Project, organizes, writes, travels, eats and sleeps the mission to protect, honor, and rebuild a strong and healthy America. So let's welcome first Dr. Burgess, and I know Thank you very much. Great to be here. Hang on. Okay. 
Give me just a second here. Okay. Again, uh, uh, thanks for, you know, we have a lot to cover today. Uh, I'm going to just jump right in. Um, hopefully uh, uh, this resonates for you. Um, we're going to begin actually with a discussion of the French Revolution. Okay. Where's it going? Oh, turn it on. It works. Yeah. Here we go. All right, there we go. It always works when it's turned on. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to start with a, a, a look at the French Revolution today. So why? Why, why study the French Revolution? Uh, it's actually very important. It was the first attempt to remake a country based on a secular philosophy. And it would, it would and, you'll, and we'll demonstrate, it sets the pattern uh, for the revolutions that would follow. So there are... What I anyway, this is my read on it. Uh, there's basically kind of uh, a pattern uh, of these six points that will you'll see the slide again because it, it's in each one of these revolutions. And so in the beginning, uh, they it begins by challenging religion and the concept of the truth, and redefining or rejecting God uh, for radical aims. The second point is it offers a secular origin story, uh, reimagining original sin and future peace. Third, it uh, moves moral conflict from an internal one to an external one, redefining good and evil and value. And fourth, it introduces a, a vision for a future utopia. And then fifth, it develops and promotes an ideology for this utopia. And then six, amazingly, it ends up labeling and planning to remove utopia's opponents. Right? So, and that's the kicker. Right? So, actually, the the modern um, world begins with Descartes and his theory, uh, his dictum here, uh, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. Why? Why is this important? Why is it so revolutionary? Well, until Descartes, uh, the Western world lived with God in his heaven as the subject of the universe, and we were his objects, the creation. Uh, our task was simply to live in harmony with God's laws. So, um, prior to Descartes... Oh, I went backwards, I'm sorry. Prior uh, to the Cartesian Cogito, the medieval world was based on two pillars. One was the great chain of being, it was the medieval cosmology, and uh, in this the earth was the center of the cosmos, God was in his heaven, and everything had its place. <coughs> the second truth was the divine right of kings, or the medieval political theory. The king was anointed by God and ruled on his behalf. Now, I'm not arguing we should go back to this. That's not the point. The point is that, um, you know, these ideas have consequences, and, and we'll see what the consequence was. Right? So, in the cogito, man becomes the subject. Right? Uh, the worldview was completely turned upside down. It said that the subject of knowledge, uh, the guarantor of truth, was none other than the thinking thing, uh, the human self. You know, while I can doubt everything, could, uh, could Descartes says, I cannot doubt that I'm the one doing the thinking. So the I becomes the lone depository of certainty uh, on which every other truth depends. This was a reversal of the order of dominion. The existence of God and every other truth depended on man, not the other way around. Right? That's a complete opposite of what went before. So human reason was the new order of the day, and the task before us then was to design a world based on reason. Uh, and we call this the rationalist revolution. Right? So again, step one. Uh, the rationalists redefine God. 
So in France, the order uh, that was developing was based on this emerging rationalist thought, and especially the ideas of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Now, Rousseau was not an atheist, but his supreme being was not the god of the Abrahamic faiths. He reinterpreted God and uh, what it means to be a human being, and finally, he reinterpreted the origin of evil. So we'll take a look through those. Um, some of the more radical revolutionaries uh, even uh, rejected uh, Rousseau's uh, supreme being. They were atheists who tried to replace God, God with the goddess of reason. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> the superimposed, but you can see in the background that's a statue of the goddess of reason, and they're, they're parading her around and, and, and uh, basically worshiping her. Right? So that, that was you know, one of the features of the revolution. So Rousseau, as I said, redefined the problem of evil. Evil's not merely a spiritual or religious question. It is a social problem, clearly. Right? So Rousseau declared in the social contract, as he says, man is born free, but everywhere he is in change. So what is the cause of the slavery? For Rousseau, the problem of evil lay not in the human heart, in rebellion against the creator, or however else religion defines it, uh, but in man's ability to pursue his own interests, putting him at odds with everyone else. In Rousseau's philosophy, in the state of nature, which is what they, uh, I'm sorry. Um, in the state of nature, uh, or the state of natural goodness, right, that, that human beings are, uh, he, you know, he believed originally lived in, um, then this pursuit of uh, private property only served to separate the noble savage uh, from his communal spirit. So Rousseau, Rousseau argued uh, that when Hobbes uh, said, uh, Thomas Hobbes, you know, his famous dictum, life in, in the state of nature, a solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, uh, he says that's, he's just projecting the failures of civilization onto this uh, noble savage, onto the uncorrupted human. So between Rousseau and Hobbes, right, uh, I mean, Rousseau's innately good human being and Hobbes' innately evil human nature, there is a traditional view adopted by most religions that we are pulled between spirit and flesh, mind and body, or the better, better angels of our nature uh, and the devil on our shoulders. So Rousseau's philosophy then has redefined the problem of corruption as private property and civilization. And it's a social problem, not a moral one. Right? So Rousseau sought to redefine uh, the social aim and create a new utopian vision. Uh, there was no way back to the pure, innocent, happy state of primitive man. That was, for him, the original human <coughs> nature. But it was possible to change civilization, to change the social order, and in the process, human nature could be perfected. This approach is one that will be adopted by all future revolutionaries. Uh, I can't emphasize this point. This, uh, all, everything that comes after Rousseau, so all the social philosophy, is based on, on, on this. Uh, the idea that we can simply change society and then everything will be fine, right? And everyone will be uh, good. Uh, so, since there's no way back, Rousseau argued for adherence to what he called the general will. Uh, it's necessary to reform society. Uh, the, the individual will had been corrupted by the pursuit of selfish interest, the pursuit of private property. So uh, there needed to be some common cause to which all would subscribe. The general will was what's in the best interest of society as a whole. Right? That sounds good, right? Uh, by pursuing the general will, mankind could create a new state, not based on the old superstition, right, the church and the monarchy, you know, which they identified as superstition, but one based on reason. 
It sounds great, but the question has to be asked, what is this general will, right, that everybody should subscribe to? Well, Rousseau doesn't have an answer. Um, somehow we're just all going to know what it is, and we're all going to follow it. Right? So I, 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 we're setting up a, a future problem here. So ideas are great. They matter, right? And these are the ideas that are behind the rationalist revolution. But ideas themselves don't make revolution. I'm sorry, this isn't working as well. Um, so the ideas uh, themselves don't make a revolution. They're necessary, but they're not sufficient. For ideas to make revolution, they must first be turned into an ideology and a political program. So what is an ideology? And this is from a philosopher by the name of John Kekis. An ideology is a worldview that makes sense of prevailing political conditions and suggests ways of improving them. Typical ideologies include, among their elements, a metaphysical outlook that provides a God's eye view of the world, a theory about human nature, a system of values whose realization will supposedly ensure human well-being, an explanation of why the actual state of affairs falls short of the perfection, and a set of policies intended to close the gap between the actual and the ideal. This last component, a commitment to a political program and its implementation, is what distinguishes ideologies from religious, personal, aesthetic, or philosophical systems of belief. Ideologies aim to transform society. Other systems of belief do not involve such a commitment. If they do, they become ideological. Okay. So I, it's important to understand. This is, this is why we're studying the French Revolution. Because what happened is the revolutionaries took Rousseau's ideas and they made an ideology. Uh, and we're going to see how that turned out. So uh, the first ones to take the philosophy and turn it into a revolutionary ideology were the Jacobins. Uh, and their leader, Maximilien Robespierre, and whose name you've all heard. Rousseau was a strict believer in Rousseau. He, he patterned himself after Rousseau, and he believed he was anointed uh, to implement Rousseau's vision. It was left to Robespierre and the revolutionaries to take these ideas and turn them into a revolutionary ideology. Uh, but the most pressing question for them remained, what is this general will that we're all going to follow? Right? Uh, since Rousseau doesn't provide an answer, it was left to Robespierre. His answer was, uh, as the leader of the revolutionary party, he was the one who was best positioned uh, to decide what the general will required. Right? The general will is what Robespierre says it is. And I think we can see <laughs> this is the place in which the philosophy and the ideology begin and the disconnect uh, between them begins. Right? The revolution that was philosophically based on reason, uh, or the general will, was in reality grounded in a political struggle between the uh, ancient regime, the ancien regime, uh, the old monarchy, and the clergy, on the one hand, and the working poor of Paris, the so-called sans-culotte, it referred to the riches that they were, and the Paris Commune, which was a, a government in, in the city of Paris that they formed. Uh, so the Jacobins were on the side of the sans-culotte and uh, the Paris Commune. So the philosophy rejects the traditional religious view of the infinite worth and value of each individual. Good and evil is based not on the person, but on whether the person supports the revolutionary cause. So the revolutionaries developed a, 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 a plan to attack those uh, on the side of the old superstition, right? the government and the, uh, and, and the church. Uh, and they required the priests, they, actually this was a law they passed, the civil constitution of the clergy, that they passed and it required the priests to swear allegiance to the state, not, not the pope. Right? 
and the the it was on pain of death if if they you know were caught and and failed to do so right also the revolutionary government seized the church's assets in the name of justice so those who resisted were branded as enemies of the revolution so um as if this is a historian McPhee says, many historians have seen that the civil constitution of the clergy as the moment which fatally fractured the revolution. Right? So the, uh, what it did is it turned, it, again, good and evil is based on whether you're one of the revolutionaries supporting Robespierre or whether you're opposed. Uh, but we can't simply allow people to disagree. Right? Uh, so those who opposed, um, well, um, yeah, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Actually, in uh, January of 1793, they executed uh, uh, Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette, the king and queen, and abolished feudalism. Right. So not only the clergy, but they went after the old uh, government as well, and the and the the uh, aristocracy that had preceded them. Right? In doing so, they naturally created enemies, right? Both within the nation and the neighboring countries. So it led to a civil war within, right? People rising up within the country, yeah. and also wars with their neighbors as well. Right? So how do you address this reaction, right? Well, they created a revolutionary army uh, of these working poor, the saint culottes and they, their job was to enforce the new rules and to attack those privileged groups. The Revolutionary Army was charged with forcing the, enforcing the will of the government and fighting its opponents. The question so many have asked is, how is it possible that the revolutionaries create, you know, uh, committed to creating a government based on reason and not on tradition and superstition could end in something like the reign of terror. Um, well, to replace the superstition grounded in this Judeo-Christian mythology, right? That was their their belief. They were replacing the old superstition with reason. Um, they 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 create you know, and to create a government based on reason and virtue, they argued that they simply had to eliminate those tyrants who opposed them. They branded the people who didn't agree with them as evil, and they had to uh, get rid of them. So, um, again, this is uh, Kekis, who, as you can tell, I like. Uh, put another way, uncorrupted human beings intuitively recognize and act in the general interest. Right? They follow the general will. Any divergence between the individual and general interest indicates the individual's immorality and irrationality. So if any individual fails to see that his true interests are the same as the general interest, he must be forced to act as if he did see it for his own good. <laughs> or <laughs> he doesn't say this, but I will, or they have to be eliminated. Yeah. And that was the that, that and this is the dictate of reason. Mm -hmm. So uh, Robespierre, he's often referred to as Robespierre the virtuous, and this is uh, a quote from him at the height of the terror: "Without virtue, terror is deadly. Without terror, virtue is impotent." And then. Also, terror is only justice, prompt, severe, and flexible. It is the emanation of virtue. Sounds like nice Here's another <laughs> quote from him. Uh, we must smother the internal and external enemies of the Republic or perish with it. Now, in this situation, the, the revolution, the first maxim of your policy ought to be to lead the people by reason and the people's enemies by terror. So, the reign of terror, <laughs> which in which 300,000 were arrested, and, and these numbers, you know, uh, 
we didn't have the same kind of uh, people counting heads like like they do today, the demographers and so forth. But roughly, uh, three hundred thousand arrested, forty thousand killed, uh, and others who fell victim to the national razor. Right. So the reign of terror was not a bug in the system. It was a feature of the revolution based on reason. Each person does not have individual have infinite value. So good and evil is decided by whose side they're on. Right? Well, at the end of the day, uh, the, the, the Robespierre's other revolutionaries saw what was going to happen to them. <laughs> it wasn't just killing enemies; then wound up being people who, who didn't agree with Robespierre, or in some cases, like people were were sent to the guillotine because somebody made a complaint against them for selling sour wine. I mean, you know, personal <laughs> grudges and stuff became involved, right? So, and at the end, uh, they, the revolutionaries banded together and uh, they went after Robespierre to pre preserve their own lives, right? So he was taken, he actually tried to kill himself, but failed, and then they executed him. So, uh, this is a very famous quote from, uh, this was a, a Girondin a deputy who was a member of a different party than the Jacobins. Revolution, like Saturn, will end up by devouring its own children. And that's exactly what happened, right? All right, uh, that's the end of my presentation, but I just want to remind you of these points, right? So they redefined God. They offered their own secular orange origin story of the noble savage. Uh, they removed morality from an internal conflict to an external one. They redefined good and evil as whether you're for or against the revolution. Uh, they had a beautiful utopian vision, uh, and they developed an ideology to promote that utopia, and they created enemies and wound up uh, eliminating them. So, and the reason why we're studying the French Revolution is this pattern doesn't go away. <laughs> we're going to see it again and again, okay? All right, well, thank you for your time. Great job, David. Um, it's so sad to find ourselves in an America where this doesn't sound like an ancient history lesson. That's the hard part of listening to that. Um, it's like, when was this yesterday? Or, and that's the, uh, but great job, uh, David. Thank you very much. Um, so David and I are kind of good cop bad cop at the very same time as what the horrors he's describing there was a counter thread or counter rail and uh, in all throughout the day I'll be presenting the what might be called the God side or the or the positive rail of the same period of history and hopefully in our present time we'll continue to be that and ultimately win this in the long run in each, in each occasion in history, uh, the good guys won. And so we can have hope uh, for the present time as well. So uh, that's the name of this conference altogether, Patriots Working Together to Reclaim American Culture. And the lecture that uh, I'm giving now, or presentation I'm giving now, is 
contrasting the French Revolution and the American Revolution. That should be singular. All right. The first premise of these lectures is, as David said, ideas have consequences. Simple criminality does not need philosophies, ideas or philosophies to cause harm but major movements leading to enslaved populations and global genocide are based on ideas and philosophies that become ideologies and are put into practice. We are studying philosophies and ideologies of the modern period that have resulted in mass totalitarianism mass and mass brutality and likewise studying philosophies and ideologies on the other side that have resulted in genuine, positive human progress, both in science and technology, and in virtues that give rise to greater human freedom, equality, and social harmony. All human beings innately desire the end of suffering and a world of fairness and peace and prosperity, yet somehow a world fitting this description eludes us. Movements that successfully diminish suffering and help us grow toward fairness and liberty and widespread prosperity are those that are built on better, more accurate understanding of reality. Because of this, they, are, they successfully move us in the direction we innately desire. We are created to relate naturally with reality. Other social and political movements are designed to bring about the very same ideals of human happiness, but for important reasons, they end up creating great evil, degradation, tyrannies, and eventually widespread death. Their hopes and intentions may not be bad at first, but clearly they are based on flawed ideas. Both groups those that help us progress and those that lead to intensified despair want the same thing. Yet one approach consistently makes progress, one approach consistently produces grotesque life and human depravity. When groups and leaders describe themselves as dedicated to fairness and happiness and yet produce horror and despair, it means their ideas are wrong, their views are wrong. People trying to protect America from ruin must be able to uh, recognize and identify wrong ideas early. It's like early cancer detection. Additionally, we must have the courage to act forcefully and decisively once we recognize a dangerous agent at work. We must uproot and eradicate these harmful ideas at the very outset before they eliminate our future and the future of our country. We must know when ideas are wrong and say so clearly. There is no purchase in trying to argue that we care and you don't. Unfortunately, this is a main habit of godly patriots today and heroes today. Every day we drown in an endless torrent of the manipulation of narratives from both sides trying to establish the claim that we care and you don't. This approach to saving our country is a dead end. We cannot magically declare that other people are badly motivated. What happens next is that we become mired in an exhausting grind of hundreds and thousands of arguments this one about conception and when human life begins, that one about gender, this one about race, that one about immigration policy, and so on. These debates are important and necessary, but we can never gain our country back by dueling data with people who do not believe in honesty and furthermore do not believe that you should even exist or should be allowed to speak. Our ability to point out bad, that bad ideas, which not only don't work, but cause great harm, is urgent. And the next thing that is also needed is to have a clear, forward-looking vision that provides truth and a viable plan that we must do to return to healthy life and culture. 
keeps us progressing towards ever greater human peace and human happiness. People have expressed worry that today's program will be too ivory tower and saying we need action, not more talk. Please be assured that the sole purpose of this gathering today and these meetings that will continue to happen across America is a burning call to action. But we must at least, at the very least, pause to look at the map. We need clarity and solidarity. We cannot afford to make mistakes. Uh, our need is not just to act, but to win. Here's the framework and scenario of our thoughts today. People should not be maltreated, burdened, and suffer. Whenever anyone sees these things, we are moved to remedy the situation. In the last 400 years, there have been two times in history when tyranny has been excessive and movements have arisen to reverse injustice. The 18th century, the French Revolution, which David just talked about, and the 20th century, the Bolshevik Revolution, which we'll learn about in the next hour. Today, our present, our, in our present situation, is a third such time. We are in such a time, and that's why it's important to study clearly and understand the plans and the victories of the past. Each time this happens, two competing forces arise in reaction and attempt to reclaim the rights of people to be free and equal. In the 18th century, the divergent forces in reaction to medieval oppression were the French Enlightenment and French Revolution on the one side and Reformation thinkers and creation of Christian democracies beginning with the American Revolution on the other side. The 20th century again uh, had inequality become to a great extreme. This time it was due to um, industrialists and, and harmonization. The anti-God, anti-religious side ended up as Marxism and materialism and the Russian Revolution. The other side was the growth and expansion of free, prosperous, Western, Judeo-Christian civilization on the other. How wonderful it would be if, after the fall of the Soviet Union and Soviet Communism, we could be building a better world today. But that didn't happen. Tragically, key strains of darkness from humanism and rationalism and materialism, which we'll hear about next, were not completely uprooted, and we're in trouble now. The new philosophies that now threaten America and free societies are the greatest threat to human life ever. We have reached the end of time. We are at an all-out, hands-on-deck alarm at the life and death juncture. We must expose the roots of error and evil, and we must overtake these forces with the same spirit as our American founders. If we are to recover and renew our nation, there must arise a sufficient contingent of us who trust divine providence, are related sacrificially to the protection of our country, and who are ready to mutually pledge to one another our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. To summarize, history occasionally creates eras of intolerable excess of injustice and suffering. In such times, movements arise to take action against this excess, to cast off a tyrannical elite, and to build societies of equality and opportunity. In the Enlightenment era, injustice reached an intolerable zenith when corrupt clerics empowered decadent monarchs and aristocrats, so that life of the common people became too bleak and human injury became too much. In the modern era, the 20th, present, uh, the 20th century, the same conditions of injustice and injury reached intolerable limits, only this time due to the combination of political power and the rampaging wealth and avarice of industrialists. That happened toward the end of the 19th century and produced Marxism and global communism. Today, all these prior threats of godless error are flowering and reaching their maximum assault on our very existence as human beings. We'll explain that clearly. We'll be learning about this throughout the day. So we begin, as you've already heard, with the Enlightenment era. 
The past is a clear model, and it is also the roots and origin of destructive philosophies today. It is important to note that looking at these eras, as we've heard, you might, I was thinking, you know, even though it's like our program, I'm like watching Dave and saying, really, I need to know about, you know, I'm thinking, is everybody all right so far, you know? But the, it's important to note that looking at these eras are valuable and necessary for a couple of reasons. First, it gives us clear models and helps us see what is going on in our present time. Secondly, they show us the roots or the unbroken chain that what began with the Enlightenment traversed through Marxist materialism fully flowered today with overwhelming totalitarianism, perverse ideologies that threaten the very foundations of human existence. Each error is a seed that grows and matures and becomes ever more toxic as it gains strength with each evolving archetype. As the Middle Ages progressed, the power to control and exploit people intensified with corruption from two places, harmonizing into one that resulted in human misery. The clerical and political corruption created a unified culture of inequality and the dam burst. The use of religion to diminish lives of peasants and serfs was especially loathsome, and the question of freedom began right there with two opposite reactions. The path of revolt flowed from the conclusion that faith and religion itself is the origin of human uh, oppression. That's what David was describing in the first half of this, uh, of this lecture. The other flowed from the view that the concentration, of the concentration of religious power in a privileged elite was the problem, not religion itself, not faith itself. French Enlightenment thinkers sought to replace religion as a foundation for life and society with human reason, whereas Reformation figures challenged corrupt religious leadership from a place of greater, more intense religious fervor and personal religious devotion. The distinction may seem small at first, but in truth, the difference is massive. It is day and night. The single distinction, this single distinction, is the surest characteristic you can re rely on to tell you with absolute certainty whether or not the person speaking with you would be perfectly at peace and untroubled with an untroubled conscience exterminating you. It is that small difference that you can tell at the beginning of the story. Without so much as a ripple in their conscience, this is extremely important to know. This is one of the big problems today, the, of the patriotic right today, the conservatives. We have been seduced into endless investment in pointing out the hypocrisy of the left. This is a waste of time. Why? Because they believe that they, not God, are responsible for removing evil. This is what David just explained. Attaining and holding power to do so is not hypocrisy in their way of thinking. It is a responsibility to eliminate you physically or in... Uh, Washington, D.C. gulags is a form of virtue. To lie and gaslight is a martial dedication. It, philosophically, this is called consequentialism. That's the name of it. It is the obligation to attain power and to silence dissent. We must know the origins of this clearly so we can be better equipped to, equipped to meet the challenges we face today. The radical left today, just like the Enlightenment rejectors of religion in the Middle Ages and the Marxist rejectors of religion in the 20th century, they have no problem at all exterminating, exterminating you or however many thousands were in the French Revolution or however many millions in the Communist Revolution or however many billions in the uh, woke and environmental correction revolution. Uh, we, this is why we're here today, is to try to prevent what these revolutions inevitably do, to remove their oper 
opposition to their self-appointed authority and control they presume to need to enforce the implementation of their remedies. In each era of reform, there is an all-important point of divergence that goes, that goes to create two radically different paths. This point of divergence is simple. If religion goes bad, should it be destroyed and replaced, or should it be fixed? The whole matter of ideology revolves around this. It is that simple. Two key flaws bake themselves into movements that regard religious corruption and excess to be the cause of injustice and corruption. Human reason takes the place of God. Intellect or cognition or science is the paramount feature of being human. For the leftist or for the progressive left, cognition is what distinguishes humans from the rest of creation. Religiously aware people, on the other hand, know that being created by God as an extension of God's divinity is the paramount feature of being human. These are the two options. These is the dividing line between political leanings. Because religion places God in the traditions, uh, I'm sorry, because religion replaces God in the traditions of the anti-faith left, being smart is equivalent to being good. You will note, for example, throughout our entire lives, if you've been conservative all your life, that conservatives are always painted by the left as stupid. <laughs> it's their stupid. Is, this is the problem. Like Reagan was stupid. I wish I was so stupid. You know, it's, that's the big crime. Listen to all urban elite media professors, etc., Conservatives, conservative voters are stupid, they're brainwashed, they're not capable of thinking. This is the elitism that comes from the misguided notion that as a group or class, they are smarter than God. We just saw the first moment of it, and now we know why it surrounds us today. It begins with the worship of reason in the French Enlightenment. People consistent with American founders, however, consider virtue, character, moral law, as the foundation on which and contribution and leadership should be based. It's that basically different. For example, take Adam Schiff. Or as a, as a, who is that old comic? Take Adam Schiff, please. Well, you know, remember that guy, take my wife, Henny Youngman. Yeah. For example, take Adam Schiff. Do conservative patriots think he is unintelligent? No. The problem with Adam Schiff is his moral character. The problem is not that he's unintelligent. The problem is that he's a liar. That's the problem. He, he embodies an important aspect of the issues we are discussing here today, what is called consequentialist ethics. Ends justify the means. Lying is okay. Are all natural in, to, in systems that reject God and religion. The reason is that universal equal value for every human being requires something universally applicable to every human being. The simple acknowledgement that we are created solves that. If you're looking for human equality, there is one constant that is applicable to every single human being you lay eyes on, you're that you're created. That is the beginning of human equality. The simple acknowledgement that we are created solves this matter. Systems for reform and organization start based on our equality. And and inviolable value are the safest, in fact, the only path to genuine progress and the expansion of greater good and happiness. Very quickly, to conclude, we have already heard from David what the rationalist, humanist, non-God philosophies of the French Enlightenment produced in their effort to lift good and innocent people up from suffering and injustice of the late Middle Ages. 
The reformers and the Godside thinkers and writers were different. Reformers did not seek to replace religion and faith, making ourselves and, re and reason higher than God as a basis for a just and fair society, but rather they invested creatively to increase the spread of religious experience among citizens, to increase religion, not replace or remove it. This is the Gutenberg Press, making the Bible available to common people, not only available just to priests, in which we have no autonomy or sovereignty over our own personal faith. This is, this is famously seen in the translation of the Bible from Latin to translations of the language of common everyday people. The invention of the Gutenberg Press to be mass printed more affordably, uh, making possible the widespread access to scriptures. This is just a small superficial sampling of what happens in the fight against equality and in, hu and in humanity when religion and religious life are affirmed rather than rejected and oppressed. So uh, I'm, I'm basically at the end of my thing. I want to show what happened from the, the problem is that the corrupt clerics and the corrupt aristocracy and monarchs made life miserable for people. The French revolutionaries wanted to fix that, didn't they? Didn't they? They wanted to fix it, didn't they? We saw what happened. They ended, okay. Uh, and then, and then the, uh, people like Martin Luther, Gutenberg, people intensifying religion sought to, sought to condemn the corruption within their religion. And here's what happened in the pursuit of greater human equality and greater human happiness. Uh, Wycliffe uh, uh, criticized the, the Catholic Church, Bible into English. Jan Hus, the abolition of the sale of indulgences. Erasmus, he remained Catholic, returned to the teachings of the early, early church. Who we got? Luther, challenging hierarchical structures. That was the point, wasn't it? That was the point of the French Revolution, wasn't it? Hierarchical structures. Council of Trent. What is it? Abuses within the church. Reaffirm Catholic doctrine. Galileo starts the, the entire scientific matter. The English Civil War. Promoting ideas of par parliamentary sovereignty and religious tolerance. And on and on. I'll make these available. I'll, I'll leave them up for a second if people are copying them. John Locke. Natural rights, constitutional government, the American Revolution, the independence of the United States, democratic principles of liberty and equality. Founding the home where the most rapid advance towards human equality, human prosperity, human uh, individual sovereignty happened f directly from the line of you can identify corruption in religion. It doesn't mean faith itself is, is the cause of human, op uh, human inequality. Here's, uh, yeah, so, the flowering of Western civilization, okay, the, the war fought between American colonists and the British Empire resulted in the independence of the United States and the establishment of a democratic republic based on the principles of liberty and equality. This is the flowering of Western civilization, the birthplace of a world of hope, a shining city on the hill, a pro the, promise, the hope and promise for the world's tired, poor, huddled masses yearning to be free. Everything hinges upon these three lines in the, in the United States Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. You know the thing. <laughs> Vote for me in November. You know, okay. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Created equal. Not all men are equal. Even the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights does not have this all-important element. Created equal. That's where equality originates, where it exists. Right. 
self-evident is what is known, the, something that is called self-evident. We hold these truths to be self-evident. This is what is called in philosophy as axiomatic. It's an axiom. You don't argue it. It's self-evident. Self-evident is known in, what, in philosophy as an axiom. The fact of our creation and created equal and have e unalienable rights, unalienable rights is axiomatic. It's not a point of debate. Uh, the founders regarded these truths as self-evident. This is America. Without it, nothing holds. And without us, the world around us collapses. The very cause for the decision to declare independence receive, uh, repeats the same axiom of the author of our lives, our purpose, and our destiny to assume among the powers of the earth that a separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them. Our founding, these people, these people went to almost a sure death against the greatest military power in all of human history, did so because, because they, they felt required by the laws of nature and nature's God. This dividing point is, is what, uh, uh, the main point of this first hour of our time. The founder and framers conclude their declaration, again, wholly and entirely in the, hand, in the hands of nature's God. And for the support of the declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. We must mutually pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Uh, here, I will, here is what happened in America. Since these, we'll cover these more and more. Here's the end of slavery, the rise of women's rights. Everything, everything that, um, that in the period after the French Revolution, which ended up just in grotesque, grotesque brutality and murder, the guillotine in the public square. How, 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 what kind of society you're, you're walking around and heads are rolling around? And this was in the name of making life better for human beings. And, and, yet, and yet, since the founding of the American Revolution, based on this simple fact, created, created equal, following the laws of nature and nature's God, look at what happened, look at what happened. Women, women's rights, slavery, the end, uh, the end of, uh, the end of uh, slavery. All these people are all um, Granville Sharp, abolitionist. John Wesley, abolitionist. William Wilberforce, end of the slave trade. Tom Clarkson, abolition of the slave trade. Does anybody know who this is? This is, this is a great thing. This is John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace. The song Amazing Grace is because God struck from, he, was, he ran a slave ship. That was his occupation. This, this is the other option. And, and the matter is a very simple one. When you see religion misbehaving, is it time to get rid of it and replace it with some form of satan, you know, like human hubris of our superiority to God? Or does one simply reform that very, th the only thing that is the guarantor of our equality and of our hope? So um, thank you very much. That's the first hour. Thank you very much. We would like to open it up uh, for a couple minutes for some question and answers. So I'll invite Dr. Kaufman and Dr. Burgess back up again. Please feel free. Someone want to go first? Uh, yes, that's the main actor the furthest man in the room. <laughs> so John Locke. Wait, wait for the, main, the mic to come. Okay, okay Scott. No, for you. John Locke was followed intensely by our founding fathers. And I want to just bring that out a little bit more in contrast. You, you did state American Revolution versus the French 
Revolution. And I want to thank you for that, because I skipped that history lesson about the French Revolution and leading up to all that information you gave us. But um, I feel you need to give us a little bit more on the philosophy and the English philosophy. You did outline that. And leading up to the American Revolution, could you add a little bit more to it? Ooh, um, David. Yeah, well, I've, I've got one one point I'd like to make about that. So, because the, the contrast between Locke and Rousseau, just to be more like stark, fault. and you, is this so? So the contrast between Locke and Rousseau couldn't be more stark. Uh, as I stated, Rousseau made private property like the original sin, right, the thing that, that corrupted human beings. John Locke promoted private property, and that's what our founders actually uh, implemented. He was, a, as you say, a, a, an incredibly important uh, philosophical force behind our revolution, because private property allowed for the greatest amount of individual freedom, right? And it allowed uh, for the kind of uh, com you know commercial since then, uh, among free people uh, to be able to trade and build, uh, based on that freedom, uh, the greatest economy and society the world's ever seen. So anyway, that would be my observation. First thing about Locke, right? So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, the, the notion of private property is defended primarily by the economists, but it should also be defended by theologians. Uh, the Ten Commandments says, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's belongings. <laughs> There's primary. So the, uh, the Rousseau ideal is, is again descending down into the human foundation, which uh, replaces the God's design for human beings. We'll see this come up more, and even in the present time, the issue of private property is not merely just good luck for, uh, for prosperity. It is equal to all the other inalienable rights that uh, are, are the birthright of human beings, not only Americans. Another question? Another comment? Joshua, yes. I think I'm the youngest person here. Yeah, that's um, good. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much. So just representing my generation, one of the things that frustrates us is whatever side of the political spectrum, everyone seems to have this kind of way of speaking or way of engaging each other that, like, oh, you're the idiot, you don't know anything, or you're immoral. Um, and oftentimes, especially what is posted on media, it's used to catch a catch the, or grab a certain audience. And I oftentimes get frustrated because I feel like people don't actually talk. Uh, even those who claim that they're creating space for talking aren't actually creating an environment where it feels like it's progressing towards a better future, or a, a brighter future for our nation. So I'm wondering, based on what you're sharing, how do we approach that? Especially, it seemed like you were notioning that we have to avoid that in some way. We have to kind of reach a higher level of, of thinking and engaging with one another. Thank you. Should I? Yeah. All right. Thanks very much, Josh. Um, the ideal of harmonious environments has two options. One, one the, a, a kind of a dreamy sense that in which a, a flat plane that just simple acceptance. The fact of the matter is that that's not possible for any human being, simple acceptance. So the idea is don't argue with each other, embrace each other, get along. But there's no human being that, for whom that is entirely the case. Everyone has a place in which there is no longer simple acceptance. Take my child away from me and go do this or that to her. There, there is not, there's no space where flat, the kind of call of, I don't want to call it, of the youth, of, of idealists, oh, why must anybody speak negatively about somebody? <laughs> Sooner or later, every human being must speak negatively about something. 
So the flat, dreamy, oh, you guys are arguing all the time, is it's pleasant because most people don't live around the edge of where they recognize great harm about to be done, like to my own young daughter, for example. The other, the other space in which one can genuinely create a progress, the ideal that you're describing, is to, is to acknowledge that it's not flat, and that the way the largest community can progress towards the, the harmony that we all dream of is to be able to openly converse about the, the closer points of contact where you say this is okay, and I think I think this is actually not okay. Uh, I tried to I tried to create a very sharp point of diff divergence. Humans are better than God. Humans are created by God. That that's not exactly the same. Um, in a in a prosperous land, you can have uh, you do you. That, that you know you do you is fine for. Everybody's making sixty, eighty thousand dollars. Yeah. Okay, you do you. You know, but the but if you're observing or serious or sharp, basically there needs to be conversation and a growth of of shared and common value systems. So we can we all know you don't take my daughter and do X, Y, or Z. To this much we know, but but the problem of that that gets all the way out there starts earlier on. And there needs to be conversation. Uh, there needs to be an environment to con where it's presumed that there are better and worse. Uh, and and this, is, this is a vital necessity. Because what happened is social media created too much acrimony. And so people just want, please stop talking against anybody. It's the acrimony that's the problem. But but to, to point out views that are problematic should never be considered a problem. You, you'll never have health, social health, even in your own family, if, if that were the standard of things. Uh, so that's a um, I don't know if David wants to respond, and then there's a, a question. I don't know okay. about our time. Uh, we're short on time. My job is to keep things rolling roll along, so maybe we just have enough time for David to make a few comments. But we could take another question. Yeah, I did just very quickly. I think um, I see some faces around here that look like they might have been around as long as me. Uh, I, I uh, you know, I grew up, we grew up in, in a world uh, where people thought about politics, but we had more, or we thought we had more in common than we had that separated us, right? So I think, to, to just emphasize Frank's point, uh, the problem isn't the difference of opinion. Uh, the problem is you actually, actually, you have to actively create that commonality, right? Um, and we've, we've actually taken steps in this country along the way to, as Frank said, social media, other things, to, that the, the divisive voices predominate, right? But you actually need voices that are bringing people together, activities that bring people together, ceremonies that bring people together. That's the world I grew up in, and it actually worked pretty well. We didn't have all problems solved, and we still have work to do. But, um, but my answer to, to that is that we're not going to get rid of the uh, differences and the divisions, but we have to promote uh, the things that bring us together and that uh, uh, connect our common humanity. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Dr. Kaufman, Dr. Burgess. <laughs> uh, my job is kind of, I'm the, I'm the bad guy, because I have to keep things moving along. We have a lot more content to share with you. Um, Dr. Burgess is up again next, but we're going to take about a five-minute break. I know, five minutes? Are you kidding me? Okay, five minutes. Uh, if you need to freshen up the restrooms, some freshen up your coffee, and then we'll start again in about... Five to six minutes. Thank you. Give me the gun.
have to go and get it from them. Thank you for the pen. Oh, I have a group back. I have a group. <laughs> So then, I don't know how many there will be a student that will want. I don't have a pencil. I'm going to have this pencil. Give it to me. Never comes back. I forgot I missed part of that. I didn't see this as cold iron. Thank you so much. Especially back in those days. Yeah, yeah. So I could uh, No, no. So we study it's Yeah, I've got two things going on here. Yeah, I'm trying to make that so I I can't do the
Are you getting the sound? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, it's a big problem. No big. Oh, it's not a big sound. Oh, so you're getting good sound. Okay. The one thing is. You did. Okay, good. You know, the one problem I see because Jack booked on his phone, <laughs> the live stream, you know, and the speaker is in the dark. You can't see the speaker. Uh, yes, yeah. it's uh, it, uh, contrasted between the white screen and the and speaker. And the speaker. Speaker is dark. Yes. Kind of black. <laughs> but black I down. mentioned the uh, uh, screen and the So later, I'm talking about the screen. Oh, okay. Okay, good, good. All right. Good. So you can get the link. Yeah. Uh, Jack did. Jack saw it. He was watching the live stream. Okay, thank you. Please come and take a seat. Thank you very much. Sorry, we're rushing this through. We don't want to. I know that we're going to end at eight o'clock tonight. <laughs> oh no, 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 sorry. That was a different meeting. Uh, so we're going to just keep things moving. I'm going to introduce again Dr. David Burgess, who's going to start our next presentation. And here we go. Let's welcome Dr. Burgess. Thank you. So now, uh, something probably a little more familiar. Um, we're going to talk about the, the, the rise of materialism, Marxism, and the Russian Revolution. So uh, you've seen this slide, um, and you're going to see it again. Uh, but the reason why we did, uh, well, we went back all the way to Descartes and, and the French Enlightenment is because the pattern begins there, but it's picked up by revolutionaries throughout the, that, the whole time period, right? So, in the case of Marxism, we clearly, there was a challenge to religion uh, and a, a, different sec a different secular origin story. Um, and... Um, the moral conflict was moved from an internal one to an external one. 
there was a new, the most utopian uh, philosophy you've ever seen, uh, and a, an ideology that was designed to promote that utopia, and finally, uh, the uh, uh, attempt and ability to uh, identify class enemies and eliminate them on a scale that has probably never been enough. So, uh, between uh, the French Revolution and the rise of, uh, of Marxism, there were a number of developments, right? Uh, the French Revolution ended uh, 1793-94, uh, and Marxism uh, began to rise in the last half of the 19th century. So by this time, atheism had replaced deism as the basic understanding of the uh, of of the, uh, the, the that era's progressive uh, uh, thinkers, right? And uh, so with the failure of the French Revolution, um, then the idea of creating a society based on rationalism, uh, that is human reason alone, was no longer uh, a viable option. Okay. So Marx himself was a full-blown atheist and materialist. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what that means in a minute. Uh, between the late 18th century and the mid-19th century, critics of religion moved from critiquing orthodox traditions to rejecting God altogether. So Marx actually considered, and you've heard this before, the o it's the opium of the people. Yeah. He openly expressed hostility towards God and religion, uh, but beyond his own personal antagonism toward religion, he viewed it, and quite rightly so, as an anti-revolutionary force. Traditional concepts of right and wrong simply would not permit the kind of violent revolution that he envisioned and promoted. He sought to replace religion with a new kind of secular system. So, um, this takes just a little explaining here. So, after the French Revolution came the Napoleonic Age, the rise of Napoleon, and uh, it replaced the debacle of the French Revolution. Uh, at that time, a young German philosopher, Hegel, uh, attempted to create a philosophical system that united rationalism and its critics, the empiricists, into a unified system. So Hegel and I... Uh, uh, Hegel and idealism, you can see here at the bottom of the slide, right, um, was uh, his new social theory. And what, it, what he argued was that history is the working out of spirit, and there's resonances of Holy Spirit here, uh, and mind and ideas. Uh, these were uh, coming to know itself through human history. And again, we don't need to go too deep into philosophy, but it's an attempt to unite uh, both subject and object, unite uh, God and human beings into one philosophy. But again, it's a human philosophy, right? So, and this was the goal of history, the purpose, the, the telos as they call it, right, of history. So that's um, basically uh, Hegel's world is that, and the material world is subsidiary, right? The, the idea and idealism is foundational, and then the material world comes based on it. Okay, this is <laughs> what, what Marx said. You've heard this before, I'm sure you have. So, uh, or, or even if you haven't, Marx. Uh, Marx says, uh, you know, the, that he turned Hegel on his head. Actually, Marx didn't say that. Marx said he found Hegel standing on his head and turned him right side up. Um, but uh, anyway, the saying goes, um, usually uh, Marx turns Hegel on his head. So in other words, he adopts the Hegelian philosophy, but makes material and materialism primary. And all ideas and everything else emanate from 
material in the material world, right? Or materialism. So, and so his philosophy, his new mythology, if you will, his is uh, he calls it historical materialism, right? And uh, so, and he replaces the Hegelian mythology with this. He argued that humankind was originally free, but poor in poverty, and there were scarce resources. So he called this uh, origin state primitive communism. Again, this is Marx's <coughs> theory, his philosophy. Right? Uh, and he suggests that human beings had to pass through uh, stages to its ultimate goal, which would be a pure, pure communism, right? The, the classless state. So this is a di By the way, these diagrams are not mine. Uh, I pull this from the people that are, you know, teaching this stuff, right? So this is. And so, uh, according to this historical materialism, the solution to the problem of scarcity was the division of labor to grow wealth. Right? If we're all equal but equally poor, uh, what's the how do you uh, resolve the problem of poverty? So this, that was his philosophy, that uh, the division of labor was a good thing uh, to grow wealth. Uh, you know, Rousseau, as I mentioned earlier, had believed that private property was the original sin. Marx didn't disagree with that, but he thought it was simply a necessary evil. Right? So the outcome produced wealth, but it also produced unequal development and inequality. And so it created classes, right? So, right, on the one hand, if some people accumulate more, they do it on the basis of the toil of others. Right? Uh, and then for Marx, that meant that classes mean uh, oppression. There's a ruling class at exploiting a working class who are oppressed. So the inequality of the classes is the new original sin, and it can only become, be overcome uh, through violent revolution. So again, Marx takes the Hegelian idea and makes the goal of history, uh, it's, it's material for him, and achieving ever greater material well-being. Uh, like Hegel, that process necessarily took, took place through conflict, and he called this dialectical materialism. So again, this is another chart describing how society will go through stages until it reaches uh, the proletarian rule, right, of the democratic communist people. Right? So instead of spirit coming to know itself to human beings, it was essentially kind of like material coming to realize itself or realize a just society. Uh, if that doesn't make perfect sense to you, you're paying attention, that's good. But, you know. um, and, and so as we pointed out before, then it, once you have this, this new mythology, you have to uh, uh, re redefine what it means to be human. Right? So he redefined human nature on a materialist basis. Uh, men begin to distinguish themselves from animals as soon as they begin to produce their means of subsistence, a step which is conditioned by their physical organization. And that's Marx from the, the, uh, the German ideology. Right? All history is nothing but a continuous transformation of human nature. Um, this term species being is the one that he came up with. Um, and uh, so the materialist view is simply that human beings are created by their environment. Uh, ideas and relationships are all the products of the mode of production. So his view of human nature is very much influenced also by Darwin. Uh, okay. Since uh, human nature is determined by the economic system, Good and evil cannot be applied based on moral principles. Moral principles are nothing but the values of the ruling class that they impose on those that they rule. They are designed to maintain the status quo of the ruling class. Right? 
So instead, I mean, he argues that, the, again, these, the form of production, the economic base, determines everything else in what he calls the superstructure, all of culture and education, religion, the state, all the social institutions, are based on the economic base. And Marx is really quite a determinist. It, it, they are absolutely determined by that. Um, so the solution is, well, we've got to change the economic base. It's, it's, again, it's, he it, it has very much in common with Rousseau. You change society so that people can become uh, true human beings. So Marx argued that good and evil depended on whether actions promoted the revolutionary aims of social change. Since we are products of our environment, good people are created by good societies. But the ruling class, the oppressors, do not create good societies, so they must be overthrown. So good and evil is, you know, oppressors are evil and the oppressed are good. So that was, you know, the utopian ideal then uh, that he tr that draws from this is that, uh, again, you've heard this, from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. You know, what, what sounds better? Um, as we saw, though, it, it is, it's, it, it comes to conflict. So Marx's theory, it predicted that the working class would achieve class consciousness. And that meant they would understand their role in creating the utopian future. They would rise up and overthrow the capitalist class, ushering in a new classless society that would achieve the goal of historical materialism, um, of mature communism. Right? And this would eliminate the history of inequality and oppression. Unfortunately, that never actually happened. Um, <laughs> again, you know, another another beautiful theory destroyed by uh, a fact, right? Just an ugly fact. Um, the proletariat did never did achieve the so-called class consciousness. What they did instead was create trade unions and promote their own economic and political interests, and they succeeded in creating better lives for uh, for themselves within capitalism. Rather than overthrowing it, they made it stronger. Revolution never happened in a single capitalist country. Uh, as with the general will in the French Revolution, this is where the theory breaks down. Right? So then, what happens, right? Uh, so, uh, on, the, on the right is, is the ideas of socialism, on the left, those of communism. Uh, the theory uh, was revolution would usher in a socialist society in which everyone shared equally. Communism was supposed to be the stage that came after socialism, but instead it, it becomes synonymous with a system of state control. So how did that happen? Well, uh, as I uh, mentioned in the French Revolution, um, uh, philosophy does not make a revolution by itself. Right? It needs an ideology and it needs uh, a political um, agenda. So the actual first revolution that called itself Marxist uh, was the Bolshevik Revolution led by Lenin. And uh, Lenin took advantage of another failing uh, monarchy uh, and seized power in Russia. Like Robespierre and the Jacobins, they took Marxist philosophy and created a revolutionary ideology, Marxism-Leninism, right? And a revolutionary party to create the revolution that Marx never did. So they offered peace, land, and bread to a war weary Russians. Like Robespierre, Lenin became the last word in what Marxism meant. He interpreted everything. Like the Jacobins, they faced both internal and external opposition. And like the Jacobins, they sparked a civil war 
and also wars with their neighbors. They created class enemies. Actually, in the case of Marxism, it was actually in the theory itself, unlike in, in the rationalist theory, but it was part of the theory itself. So, but in, many, in, in every other respect, it's a replay of the French Revolution. They attacked and destroyed churches and the old nobility. They called them the bourgeoisie because it was supposed to be that, but in Russia it, was, it wasn't. Right? And so, uh, where, there were, where there was opposition, like the French revolutionaries created a revolutionary army, uh, they created um, a plan to deal with this internal dissent. <laughs> the secret police uh, was known uh, in Russian as the Cheka. And uh, the Cheka was the first secret police, you're more familiar with the KGB, which was a, a successor organization, right? And to eliminate class enemies. So, and of course, later on, this wound up becoming a gulag system. So, you know, I read you some, uh, uh, some quotes from Robespierre before, right? Here's some quotes for, from some of the Bolsheviks, right? Uh, Grigory Zinoviev uh, was uh, one of the leading revolutionaries, a uh, he was a close ally of Lenin and then later a very close ally of Stalin. So he says, to overcome our enemies, we must have our own socialist uh, militarism. We must carry along with us 90 million out of the 100 million of Soviet Russia's population. As for the rest, we have nothing to say to them. They must be annihilated. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. So as uh, uh, you know, as we pointed out earlier, in the great, in in the reign of terror, there was forty thousand. Zinovius is 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 calculating that uh, ten million people have to die. Sadly, he grossly underestimated. But <laughs> uh, so they actually bragged that they had learned from the Jacobins' mistakes. Right? The Jacobins didn't have a uh, a theory; they made it up on the fly. Uh, for how to deal with opposition, right? And that's what Robespierre did, right? This is another, uh, he was the chief of the Ukrainian Cheka, right? I mean, the Soviet Union was made up of different nation states. We are not fighting against single individuals. We are exterminating the bourgeoisie as a class. Do not look in, in the file of incriminating evidence to see whether or not the accused rose up against the Soviet with arms or words, ask instead to which class he belongs. What is his background, his education, his profession? These are the questions that will determine the fate of the accused. That is the meaning and essence of the Red Terror, right? So basically we're going to eliminate everybody who's not one of us, right? right? That's the plan. So according to Marxist theory, we were supposed to wither away, the state was supposed to wither away into a classless utopia. What happened? Okay, sorry. But uh, I love this quote from Joseph Stalin, and if you understand it, please explain it to me. <clears throat> we are for with the withering away of the state. At the same time, we stand for the strengthening of the dictatorship of the proletariat which represents the most powerful and mighty of all forms of the state which have existed up to the present day. The highest development of the power of the state with the object of preparing the conditions for the withering away of the state, that is the Marxist formula. Is it contradictory? Yes. Uh, it is contradictory. But this contradiction is a living thing and wholly reflects the Marxist dialectic. Right? <laughs> Try arguing with that, right? So, as we know, Lenin died and Stalin took his place and consolidated his power. The repression began under Lenin, but of course Stalin greatly expanded it. Uh, he used uh, 
uh, the system that was created uh, to create mass terror and complete control. Uh, like Robespierre and the French Revolution, the elimination of rivals during the Great Purges moved from attacks on other political parties to the removal of Bolshevik rivals who could potentially threaten Stalin's grip on power, right? That is the solution to all problems. Right? No man, no problem. So, you know, the... the um, and this is another great quote. The death of one man is a tragedy. The death of millions is a statistic. So the French Revolution, uh, their, 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 their motto was liberté, égalité, and fraternité, liberty, equality, and brotherhood. And that ended in the reign of terror, which killed tens of thousands. Peace, land, and bread was the motto of the uh, Bolsheviks. It's a materialist one. They were materialist. But it ended with what? With Stalin and the Gulag, right? which killed tens of millions. <coughs> so, anyway, there's a lot of history we're just kind of skimming over, but we know the story. This one in particular, we, we, we're familiar with this story. I simply would like to remind you that the pattern remains the same for the Bolsheviks as it did for the rationalists, for the French Revolution. Uh, they challenged and replaced God. In, the ca in this case, they didn't just redefine God, they replaced him, they were atheists. They offered their own secular version of history, their own secular origin story. They reimagined what the original sin was, which was uh, um, you know, class and <coughs> class oppression. And so they moved um, the, the, a moral dimension from the internal to the external, redefining good and evil as uh, the oppressor class or the oppressed. And then they, they had a beautiful utopian vision for what the future would look like, a classless society, uh, everyone equal. And so they developed an ideology to implement that. That was Leninism. Uh, and it ended in the gulag. So once again, I will argue, it's not a bug in the system. It's part of the plan. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. Okay, let's welcome up again, uh, Dr. Kaufman. Thank you. Is it accurate, David, that Soviet expansionism reached approximately two thirds of the At its zenith, yes. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Thank you. Um, patterns begin to emerge quite clearly. This is my half of this morning, the second morning lecture. God-centered Western civilization is the continued growth of the positive side uh, that I introduced during the era that resulted initially in the American Revolution. Our examination of the French Enlightenment thought and the ideology it spawned gives us a clear model of the two opposing rails along which history unfolds. One rail of correct thought helps us towards ever greater liberation, or call it desirable thought, or I, to me it sounds correct, gives us ever greater liberation, equality, and the other rail of false or incorrect thought creates ideologies, movements that lead us into deeper, more complete enslavement, suffering, 
and death. New versions of these philosophies and ideologies arise periodically whenever excesses of exploitation and inequality arise in the world. Our original nature recoils when inequality and injustice reach extremes and we become driven to action. It is just at this point where the first step will put us on a path that will intensify human suffering and make matters thousands of times worse or onto a path that will help resolve the extremes uh, of inequality and suffering and return us to moving forward to, re to realizing our natural inner call for social harmony where human beings are trusted, uplifted, and treated equally and fairly. The path that results in horror rejects religion and faith as the enemy of human well-being and ends up in barbarity and gore. The path that moves us forward, on the other hand, dismantles the structures of crushing deprivation and builds great societies of equality and beauty. These second positive paths are those that invest in the reform, in reform and work to strengthen faith and in divine origins and divine purpose. These avenues invariably end up in greater human liberty and equality. We saw this model in high relief when, dis when studying the divergent paths tied to the Enlightenment era. This identical model repeats itself in the beginning of the 19th and throughout the 20th centuries, namely the era of Marxism, Bolshevik Revolution, and the global expansion of communism. In the Enlightenment, people suffered because those responsible for their spiritual well-being partnered with state power to degrade human life and hope. Enlightenment thinkers, instead of recognizing the problem to be rooted in human corruption, mistakenly believed that faith itself was the problem and sought to replace faith with reason, essentially replaced God with human beings. By the end of the 19th century, circumstances changed so there was no longer a corrupt clergy profiteering from the spiritual needs of people, but this time it was corrupt industrialists merging with state coercion to subjugate people through their physical needs. We face the same issue once again, annihilate or reform. The enemy now was no longer those who controlled ideas and spiritual life like a corrupt clergy, but rather became those who controlled our physical survival, the means of production, and our lifestyle and well-being. Das Kapital of Karl Marx expanded the theory, the labor theory of value, which leftists to this day continue to treat as science. This philosophy that produced a new hell in the human experience shifted from rationalism or humanism to materialism, eventually taking form philosophically of dialectical materialism and historical materialism. Many great thinkers, writers, freedom fighters during the Cold War have been excellent to point out that Marx replaced God with matter. As we heard from David, Marx had to contort himself into some very complicated knots to make this work philosophically. The fact is not, is, the fact is that it is not possible to erect a functioning metaphysics from such a starting point. It's not possible. That is why sooner or later, Marxists end up having to murder people or silence them because the system is indefensible at the end of the day. What many anti-communist writers and thinkers fail to point out that Marx's elemental stroke of removing God is not novel. He is not the first to try to create an account of reality and human life and history starting from something other than God, creation, and providence. Enlightenment writers and thinkers already tried this once. They chose human reason, not matter as the starting point, they too eventually led to the spilling of blood, creating a world uh, 
instead of creating a world of their hopes. This is far less common to read about in accounts of the delusion of the Enlightenment system, even though the same cardinal error lies at its root. In Marx's case, just like with the French Revolution, the evil that is the cause of human suffering is embodied in a specific group of people that had to be eliminated if they were incapable of being re-educated. The source of human suffering at this time was not corrupt clerics and religious institutions, but corrupt industrialists and capitalists and their systems and institutions. Marx and Marxist thinkers, writing in the era of the industrious and capitalist progress, severed human life from the divinely ordained relationship we need to live creatively and fruitfully in nature, the material world. So please follow that. The, the, issue, the issue is not removing us from our ideas and reverence towards the divine. It's removing us from the God-ordained relationship between human beings and nature. That's what, this is the error of materialism. In Marx's writing, the evil class deprived us of our very physical survival. The question in the face of Marxism is, what is the ideal relationship between human beings and the things of physical reality in which we need to survive? That is the question. What is the ideal relationship between human beings and physical reality, the things which we need to survive? That was the question once we shift to materialism and the corruption of the, of the uh, industrialists. Once again, the answer depends entirely on one simple starting point. Are we created or not? If we are created, the fact of physical reality and our harmonious interdependency with physical reality will define our logic and our relationship to the world. In Jewish and Christian understanding, care for, the phys for physical reality is a central responsibility of being human. This is made perfectly clear in the three great blessings in Genesis 1.28. Islam and other religions have a similar teaching. In spiritual systems, care for physical reality is higher than common environmentalism. It is humanitarian. We care for the earth and all of nature as part of human compassion. We do so, we care, for, we care for the physical well-being of our fellow people. So it is human compassion that lies at the root of the stance that patriots and God-centered people need to take in the face of materialism. The structure of our relationship with physical reality and the responsibility to care for it for the sake of our common human survival and welfare is put on us by our Creator. The clear position of figures like John Locke and Adam Smith on the necessity of private property derives directly from the self-evident truth that people are created by God. Only secondarily is this affirmed because of prosperity. Prosperity is just a natural way that God desires human beings to live in. But that's not why, um, that's not why the... the uh, divine relationship of man and nature is affirmed. Only secondarily is it affirmed because of prosperity. Of course, it produces prosperity because it conform, conforms to God's ideal of caring and being responsible. That it, it is the place where our humanness blossoms in the arena of profit, property. Anything in violation of God's design and purpose naturally travels the path to ruin. Socialism bankrupts and impoverishes life for many reasons, including those not seen in the arguments of free market economists. The real bankruptcy of socialism goes deeper than that. It should be rejected because it is a philosophy that separates people from nature and reality. Marx and Engels replaced God with the magical view that nature is able to do God-like things, like give rise to consciousness, an orderly universe, and even give rise to spirit. Except it does so by accident, 
without goodness and without purpose. How is it that a patently false and ultimately evil ideology, despite its failure, took over two-thirds of the world? And it did so not just geopolitically and militarily. It did so but took over the minds and devotions of the Western intelligentsia that still control our colleges and now produce an assembly line of progressive and radical leftists who graduate from these institutions and then take over uh, childhood education, media, corporate boards, entire political parties, and government agencies. How, do, how does something that patently and evidently confusing as a philosophy still hold the grip of the intelligentsia and the work producing uh, higher education institutions. How could Marxism, which is so fundamentally wrong and responsible for global genocide, retain such devotion and longevity? Some of the reasons are that it seized both the emotional and intellectual needs and trends of the day. We have to watch out for this dynamic contaminating American culture around us similarly today. Emotionally, Marx accu accurately identified human despair and inequality, emotionally. And intellectually, he and Engels don donned the garb of science, which was the new and latest home of truth that was captivating the 20th century. It was the way to be modern. It was the way to be cool. That's science. <laughs> Science and technology would be seen as the great fixers of human problems, not virtue, compassion, patience, sacrifice, and integrity. What would fix our human difficulties and inequalities is science and technology, not human problem, not virtue, compassion, patience, sacrifice, integrity that are found in the fundamental basis of faith. Converts to Marxism felt it to be modern, not backward like those superstitious flat earth Christians who don't believe that who don't believe that we come from apes. With the greed, excess, and inhumanity of the robber barons, the same divergent roads presented them once themselves once again. Destroy or reform. Thoughtful people easily know that owners bear burdens, endure risk, invest in long, thankless hours needed to keep corporations alive that provide countless people with the chance to earn an honest wage for, and support their families. Tragically, however, many owners become corrupt, addicted to greed, inhumane, and this, this, this results in human despair and alienation. Again, we must choose an option, destruction of the free market system, or correction and reform. That was the divergent path uh, that faced, this time, the uh, Bolshevik Revolution. Marx chose the former, violent revolution. Destroy and remove the bourgeoisie. David, with a very casual and calm voice, uh, nevertheless brought the graphic reality of that to us. Destroy and remove the bourgeoisie. Get rid of all natural bases for creativity and development. Replace it, I'm sorry, my language is a little bit excited here. Replace it with the absurd fantasy of collective ownership without the ennobling dignity of prosperity, private prosperity, responsibility, and reward for hard work. Marx was perfectly wrong in these three areas, and his followers and devotees nevertheless became addicted to these, the labor theory of value, dialectical materialism, and historical materialism. Marx proposed remedies and solutions to human equality and suffering that were so deeply flawed that once his, once his writings were translated into applied ideology, they produced the single largest death and enslavement machine in human history so far. Worse than this awaits us today if we do not sever the root of the successor philosophies of Marx, 
human extermination will far exceed what happened under communism. The labor theory of value has been thoroughly discredited by economists and philosophers from the time of its presentation. More importantly, from the record of its abject failure in every and all societies where efforts were made to put communism into effect. These are some of the classic arguments by economists that point out the uh, unsustainability or flat out inerrancy of the labor theory of value. It, it, fails, to, it fails to note that individual, the value that individuals place on a good or item is what uh, is where value lies. It, it disregards utility, the usefulness of a product to the consumer. Technological change. It, it fails to account for how technological advancements advance the amount of labor required to produce a product. Market dynamics. The role of supply and demand. Difficulty in measuring labor, skills, productivity, and technological assistance. All of these things, these are just a tiny few of the refutations of Marx's labor theory of value. But despite these true and clear arguments, there remains something in Marxism that is even more profound. The great defenders and builders of the free market philosophy do not point out the progression from the Enlightenment rejection of God to Marx's even deeper rejection of God. Most people of our generation never thought of the French Enlightenment as a particularly bad or dangerous thing. Most of us think of it as a good thing. We got the vote, you know, Democrats. Et cetera, et cetera. In Marx's case, however, everyone knows that Marx and communists are openly and overtly against God, religion, and faith. No one denies this, including active communists and followers of Marx. But Marx did not just present a different version of rejecting God and faith. He went far deeper, which is one of the main reasons such great evil in the world was done in his name. You recall that Enlightenment thinkers praise, placed reason higher than God, undermining our intrinsic value as created by God with a purpose. But Marx placed matter higher than God. Something more crude and more base than reason. It's, it's a deeper, it's a deeper of offense of atheism matter. Human reason at least is something elegant, but to place matter higher than God, he also placed matter higher than human beings. Marx elevated matter to the supreme position in the universe, higher than God and higher than human beings. From this come the anti-human strains found in the echo-hysteria movements of today, that matter is higher than human beings. Human beings are the main source of evil. This is the same worship of science that spawned the modern era, fueled recent illegal and unconstitutional lockdowns and criminal government-directed censorship. <laughs> Under Marx, matter is greater than both God and human beings. Random acts of bias filled his teaching with error. Let us look again at that slide I just ha had up. Here's the point. Subjective value, humans determine value. Disregard for hu utility, usefulness. Usefulness is a human determination. The value of a product made is, is the human being that determines its value. Technological change, technological advancements. It's human creativity that produces things. You don't just have a flat amount of labor that, that enters into the value of a thing. Uh, same with market dynamics, supply and demand, entirely a human. And the bottom of this slide is not, uh, not showing, I don't believe. But the difficulty in measuring labor, skills, productivity, 
levels of technological assistance. This is all fundamental error. It's not small miscalculations in economics. It's not arguing about market trends and, and, and things that are popular in one season or something like that. There, it's a basic misplacement of where value lies. The capacity to produce value is a human function. It doesn't reside in matter. This is a deep, a deep problem with the Marxist teaching. By God's grace, uh, the Soviet Union and militant atheism was defeated politically and militarily during the Reagan era. Now we just have to overcome two last strongholds and backwaters of failed communism. Those are the CCP, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, it remains Marxist, and Western institutions and intelligentsia fed by Western colleges and universities. For some inconceivable reason, remain Marxist. I, okay, somehow. It is not just enough to complain about it and call it wrong. A basic understanding of its errors is necessary. The myriad of particular errors are less important than its core essential error. That is materialism, its materialism and its hostility to God and faith. Yes, Marxists overtly said religion is the opium of the masses, but his religion to God and faith is intrinsic to his metaphysics that long preceded that statement. That opium of the masses was a utilitarian observation, but the philosophy, the metaphysics, it's intrinsic that matter is superior to God, and that's wherein lies the divergence that I've pointed to in this lecture and in the prior. In addition to the anti-God and anti-human foundations in his labor theory of value, the errors that make Marxism inherently destructive, they also explain why today's radicals are so limitlessly violent. Dialectical materialism and historical materialism. Dialectical materialism is Marx's theory of the nature of being. That is the ground of being. It's, dialect, it's materialist and it's dialectic. Historical materialism is what causes history to unfold. So he has two core, in addition to the labor theory of value, he has two core elements to his philosophy. The nature of being is, a, is, dialect, is dialectical materialism. How history flows as it does, that's historical materialism. These two theories, both, adopt the doctrine of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. That's how we have being. That's how history unfolds. This, in short, define the nature of being and the nature of, conf of progress as driven by conflict. Please catch that if you catch nothing else. The dialectical materialism says that being is grounded in conflict. That's what, that's what makes, it, makes our existence even possible. Everything is possible by the nature of conflict. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis is driven by conflict. In both dialectical and mator historical materialism, everything is quintessentially in conflict even existence itself. All of human history progresses by means of conflict. Violence is the animating basis of all reality and all human development. This is the philosophical core of Marxism. That's the problem. See, this is... Oh, okay. Here's another bit of my bias. This is why pointing out the peacefulness of J6 tourists or BLM cop killers is to no avail because the philosophy at its base, the core axiom, is that it is all conflict. It is the exact opposite of the explanation found in every religion and faith about the nature and purpose of creation. The, the faith-based foundation for being and for historical progress is not conflict as the, as, the, as the dynamic. 
It's harmony as the dynamic. This is, this is entirely the point of divergence once again. Nature itself, the birds and the bees, the planets and the stars, stars are all the story of love and symbiosis. They're mutually supportive. They don't advance, they don't produce the basis of life by means of conflict. That is the core and essential violation of, what, of Marx's theory. And that's why it, it is as violent as it is. That's why when you said, when you were joking, you said, I, that's Stalin's explained it to me. If uh, He got it, in fact. He got the point. He says it's contradictory. He manifests himself in that comment as the world's greatest Marxist understander because of what I've just explained, if you, if you catch what I'm saying that Marx, Marx asserts that existence itself is conflict and violence. World faiths affirm the very opposite. Religion and faith call for people to seek harmony, understanding, forgiveness, grace, mercy, embrace, and patience. Does anybody in the room go to church? Probably yes. Have you ever heard of any of these things in your church? Probably yes, I would think. Grace, mercy, forgiveness, patience. It is, the, it is metaphysically the, point, the exact opposite of Marxism, not only its materialism, but its dialectic, who were finally the people who successfully addressed and alleviated the injustice and suffering of the workers and outcasts to which Marx reacted. It was people of faith who lived in the simple and obvious common sense observation that the earth and people are created. It's common sense. Who creates themselves? What creates itself? It's, it's metaphysically, it's logically a pretzel. It's, it's a non-starter. And so, so even, you don't even have to be a, religi a religious person. What creates itself? This, neither nature nor human beings have the power or ability to create ourselves. The simple common sense observation is the beginning of faith and the beginning of human heartedness that always brings about greater equality and greater opportunity. While Marx and Marxists brought millions to bleak darkness, hopelessness, enslavement, and ultimately death, the inheritors of God's covenant and providence lifted up millions to a better life. Here is just a small list of the people who, guided by the common sense understanding that of, of the existence of a creator, which guides every person to have value and purpose. This is a similar way to the which I ended, I ended the uh, last lecture. You have the same period of time while communism is killing and, and enslaving and marching the long march, and uh, the, the destruction of the, um, uh, the red Chinese, uh, what's the? What's the uh, yeah, but the red Chinese destruction of the the Cultural Revolution, and so on and so forth. At the very same time that these things are happening, here's what you have going on as an extension of, of the simple affirmation of a creator. Martin Luther King, racial equality. Doris Day, founder of Catholic Worker uh, Women's Rights, Catholic. Jabra uh, uh, Heschel, Jewish theologian, civil rights, social justice. Abernathy, King, racial, racial equality. Shuttlesworth, racial violence. Lawson, nonviolence. All of these, all of these come from Judeo-Christian influence. Civil rights movement. Desmond Tutu, everybody knows. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, everybody knows. Elie Wiesel, everybody knows. Women's rights, Sojourner Truth, abolitionist and women's rights. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, social activist, uh, women's rights. Same, same reaction, 
same reaction. The the industrialists and capitalists and the great the great uh, inequality and and oppression of people. That's legit. It's legit. That's why Marxism has pull. It has sway. It attracts people. Yeah, nobody likes greedy capitalists who, who 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 destroy lives. People working themselves to death. It's the simple one decision you make, and it's it doesn't even necessarily have to be much of a religious decision. It just has to be a common sense decision. What creates itself? That's why our uh, that's why our founders, uh, American founders, call this axiomatic, self-evident truths that all people are created equal, created. It's a simple matter. And look at the, look at the same period of time between the Marxist revolution and the, and the ongoing extension of the America built by our founders. So um, let me see, I'll conclude. These movements for justice and equal, equality created a century when much of the world was under the control of a genocidal elite, disappeared and imprisoned millions of people. A new and more pernicious ide ideology is at work in our time. It goes even deeper than the dark world of communism. That's what this afternoon's lectures are about. We'll learn about that uh, this afternoon. Uh, and I'll leave you with this image of a, a mostly peaceful protest. <laughs> Has a question. I'm going to just put this up. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, let's go to. Go ahead. If you could stand up, wait for the microphone. Oh, Steve? Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, I have a basic comment, no, not so much a question. Um, if anybody who listens to or believes in Marxism, took a look at Karl Marx the person and what an abject failure he was as a human being. He had a, a family, he had a wife and, and two kids could not support them. They were on the verge of starvation. They were kicked out of just about anywhere they went to live because he couldn't afford the rent. And people will turn around and listen to what he's writing and believe in that. Uh, I mean, that seems ludicrous. And then they'll put down Donald Trump, who was a success and everything he did, and you know, you make the comparison, and who would you rather be like, Karl Marx or Donald Trump? Depends who you ask. Right? Okay, hello. I, I have an I'm just an observation. I mean, I grew up, as many of you did, during the Cold War and just the scares of the evil empire, the Soviets, and all of that. Um, and so we were ingrained with the thought that communism is terrible. It's the worst thing in the world. However, somehow we're embracing that. It's been rebranded yeah. in the name of equality and equity and nonsense. But anyway, <laughs> isn't that what's happening? That yes. they kind of rebranded it? Yes. To like repackage it and sell it to us that way. Thank you so much. The the very reason why we are holding this seminar today is to suggest that it's not a mere rebranding. It's actually uh, it contains much of what we're we're trying to show a thread that has become something quite new and and even more fundamentally uh, problematic. Yeah, just that. So this afternoon's presentations will address your points, but uh, yeah, I think it's important to understand that if we don't learn from history, we're going to repeat it. But as, uh, as Frank just said, though, it's going to be uh, on a, uh, a higher or, I guess, 
deeper level uh, and more scary one, but uh, I don't want to give away too much. <laughs> Yeah, so I hope that's helpful a little bit. It's not like wait and see, or you know, but that it's, it is rebranding, but there is something qualitatively new. Uh, in, that's our, yeah, thank you. I was going to just make a comment that to what you, what this woman was saying, that I think when they took God out of uh, the classroom, that was, I remember my mother, you know, we're Catholic, and when she heard that, she was horrified because that's that's what we were. Uh, America was Judeo Christian values, and so I think that's what's got to come back. You know, uh, Dr. Choi had a question. Keith, oh yeah, oh thank you for your presentation. Uh, I feel like I'm back to a uh, college classroom. I wish I had uh, good professors like you. <laughs> uh, among so many questions uh, that I'm raising myself uh, because of time, uh, can you uh, put uh, the major two parties, uh, uh, Democratic Party and the Republican Party, uh, to the ideology issues uh, that uh, we are facing in this country and then I think that that will awaken this country's people who are trying to uh, move away from our good fortune that this country was founded upon in the socialism, eventually communism, I don't know where it's going to go, why this uh, evil power is uh, leading the majority to the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, let's see, we're, we're, trying, we're trying to have as big a possible tent as we possibly can. It, any Democrat on earth that would feel comfortable with us here today throughout the time of these lectures and content would be more than welcome here. Any Republican who would find anything problematic that we're presenting, we, we would, that's a little bit what I tried to discuss earlier in, in the uh, morning, is, um, is that you can't, you can't say this, this group is badly motivated. We're trying to say the ideas are bad, and we're trying to stick with the ideas. Um, I think all of us present have political leanings. Um, if you knew mine, I'd probably be in prison in Washington. <laughs> but uh, I'm not here to kind of uh, advocate a political thing. Uh, uh, we're trying to create clarity of the ideas so that people can be be informed and think well and decide well. How's that? I'm not a politician, but did I do all right as a politician? <laughs> yeah, I'm not a politician either, and frankly, I don't know how many universities would accept us as professors either. These days. <laughs> but, um, yeah, just a quick observation. Um, uh, God, I lost it. I had it. Okay, it was good too. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I lost it. Anyway, we're running on time. Any other questions out there? Brand website. Thank you, Dr. Kaufman, for your presentation. Um, I wanted to ask a question regarding what you mentioned about religion being peaceful, um, because as a public education teacher um, and former school board member as in elementary even, um, what they're portraying to our kids is that religion is actually violent. So when I went to a California school board um, conference, they presented as free books starting in primary grades um, to be purchased for all our schools was the Beatles song, Imagine. Imagine no heaven, imagine no hell, imagine no religion, what a peaceful place this would be, okay? It was a picture book um, wanting us to purchase for all schools. 
Then, right after that, they had a um, dance um, from high school that did the same song, Imagine. So, and especially right after, of course, the Middle Eastern um, conflicts. So they're presenting to kids that religion actually creates violence. And it's this new ideology that's gonna bring peace. So my, that's my question is, I hear what you're saying and I agree with what you're saying, but that's not how it's being presented to our students. So how can you answer that? Yeah. Good question. Um, yeah. Great question. Um, one of the things that uh, I'll give in a second, but one of the, in, in my lectures, I point out any, uh, or I, I fully allow and admit or point out that religion itself goes bad. It frequently goes bad. To try to deny that fact doesn't give much ground to stand on. But the question is the response to the to, the response to failures of the religious community to abide by the ideals of the of the uh, uh, pro professed teachings. What's the reaction? And then you can choose to try to reform the faith community, reform its leadership, or you can have the teaching that you're being forced to put forward that religion itself is the source. That's a proposition. Put it forward. Uh, it's a free country, uh, used to be. Uh, you know, um, put it forward and say, okay, let's. Religion is the core, uh, is violent and causes problems. And, and David and I just spent the morning trying to show what the option of trying to reform faith has produced, and what the option of removing religion has produced. We have two big examples in a row. Um, let's continue to talk about the matter. So, to, so, sorry, t I'm telling too long. But anyway, re religion do religion does do wrong things. What's the response to that? And when the ref when the reformation of faith, God and faith and religion is is achieved, unimaginably great things happen. When it's renewed, unimaginably horrific things happen. Uh, I don't know if we want to keep experimenting with that. Uh, okay. So first of all, uh, to Dr. Che, I remember my point. <laughs> um, they don't have anything else. If you're a secularist, yeah. you move from you know one position like rationalism to another like materialism, and to we'll look at another one this afternoon. But if you're committed to that worldview, uh, and then you don't have anything else to turn to. They would actually have to say, well, wait a minute, maybe this whole secularism thing isn't working out. But so far, people aren't doing that, right? Um, and you know, so that's, I, I think that's the point. Um, yeah. I'm not a religion specialist, so I'm just going to leave it at that. So. Okay, and I'm Brandon, so you're leaving. Yeah. One last question. Here's one up from Kate. Uh, Okay, remember, you're the only one between us and lunch. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's me and Keith. Okay, what I want to say is, it's not, is this working? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just hold Kiss it. Hold 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 it. It's not religion. It, what you need is a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus. Yes. That's what you need. And that's what will change everything. <coughs> People, mm -hmm. they go to church, but they don't live it. Yeah. And so it's not religion. There's nothing wrong with the, I mean, yes, religions, that word I don't like. Because it isn't, it's not what you need. It's not religion. It's a personal relationship with Jesus. And if you read the Bible, that's where the founding fathers got all of our laws and everything that they're doing is from the Bible. Go back to the Bible, read what the Bible says. You can't go wrong. These people don't do it. They have witchcraft and all kinds of stuff left in the White House. So why do you think it's so bad? Is because of that. They brought in the evil so bad that we can't even believe how bad it is. So that's, what, that's where we're at. We have to go back to the Bible, 
And Donald Trump does love the Lord. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he goes by what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And I stand with it. And I always have. Mm -hmm. Obama started a lot of this, too. Yes. <laughs> Good question. Okay. Um, Dr. Kaufman, Dr. Burgess, thank you very much for oh. the question and answers. Can there be a response? Or, or sure. you... Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, we have time. Thank you very much. Um, the community of people, uh, our allies here, are of every world religion. Many of them don't make the same confession as you, but many of them are your finest allies. Um, uh, proper and good-believing Muslims, proper and good-believing Hindus, their love of family, their love of the divine. Uh, so it's hard to know exactly what God will finally do in the end in order to, to manage the matter of... The Bible tells you what happened. Uh, so I'm going to do a little bit the same on this, the uh, confession of faith that Jesus alone is the answer, a little bit similar to how I did the Republican and Democrat thing. Um, there, there must, in this juncture, getting, uh, uh, building walls against desperately needed allies. I believe will lead our country to demise. I understand that on another way of looking at it, not bringing everyone to Jesus is the way to bring our country to demise. These are just points of view, but, but presently we would like as many, we would like to affirm with all of our hearts as many people for their divine value and their longing for God and their longing for a healthy America into our family. Uh, so I'll, this is the best I can do on the matter. Um, I was, uh, I, I may happen to be a Christian convert. I happen to know the experience of rebirth in Christ. So, but, but this is not, this is not what we're trying to do. Here. What we're trying to do is have a family, a family that is necessary to protect our country from very fast ruin. Uh, so, mm -hmm. please allow that to be my uh, response. Well done. Very well done. I don't want to keep anybody from lunch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, David. And thank you, thank you very much. Okay, so we have one more thing in between us and lunch, though. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> so if everybody will open their little folder, take this out. We would ask everybody if you could kindly complete this little card and just pass it over to the middle. And um, Jack and Keith, if you could come maybe go through and pick up the cards. The reason we'd like to have you fill out this card, first of all, let me let you know that your information is not sold, distributed, given in any way to anybody else. It is only uh, for the purpose that we will send you information from this conference. You'll receive um, some photographs. Uh, if you have any desire, it'll also give you links that if you would like to get some of this content, and Dr. Kaufman will explain that later. This is not for sale. This is to give to you. This is to give to everybody. You're all patriots. You probably all have uh, churches you belong to, or clubs you belong to, or organizations you belong to. This information is for you. You can take it. So. Uh, if you'll pre present this card or complete the card and pass it over, and uh, Jack, do you One have a thing. comment? Before we break for lunch, should we have somebody uh, ask Grace? Sure. Um, I got it. Yeah, I got who, it. Who would like to do that? I'll, I'll do it. Lord God, we just thank you and praise you, God, for these speakers today, Father God. We ask that you bless this afternoon, Father God, with words that you would have us all edified in, Father God. We thank you for the education they bring forth that open our eyes, Father God. We ask that we have ears and ears, eyes to see, Father God, and put us into action, Father God, to help save our nation. We're, Father, you have blessed our nation, the all nations of the world, and we ask you, Father God, to bless this food for the nourish for our body. Give us all traveling mercies this afternoon. We give you all the praise in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. So as soon as you finish your card, it's a buffet lunch. It's a pasta buffet lunch with salad and plenty of drinks. Uh, if you'll go ahead and you can get your lunch and then come back to the tables. We have a very special VIP here this afternoon who's going to speak to us during lunch. So... A good appetite. Yeah.
Oh, you need a card? Right. Anybody else need a card? Card? We need to have a couple. Um, again, do we have any more cards? We have a couple of people that need cards. Ooh. Are you going to be here all the time? Are you going to be here all the time? I can make a plate. If you want a plate, I can bring it here for you. Oh, okay. Okay. I know. So I can make a plate for you here. I'll bring one. Bring one to you, okay? Is this is the video going to be available on your website later? Oh, okay. On on uh, com. Oh, dot oh, dot TV. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Great. Uh, I, I actually am a subscriber. So yeah. So I, I, I just only just noticed yesterday that you were going to be streaming it today. So that's great. My name is Felix. Adam? Oh, okay. Oh, that's You've been with Epoch TV for a while? Oh, is that right? Oh, okay. You mean in down? Last year for, for the settlement project? Oh, okay. okay. Oh, was that in Torrance or in down? Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I went to that one also. Yeah. I'm not, uh, but I'm I'm Cantonese. Are you you you're from China? Okay, from where in China? Oh from China. Oh, okay. How long have you been in the United States? Oh, not too long ago. Oh, okay. Really? How did you... How were you able to immigrate to the United States? Oh, you did? Last time, you know. Okay. So you were in Shanghai when she was first in prison? Oh, okay. I see. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. How? So you said that she was in prison for three and a half years? Oh, okay. Which three and a half years was that? Like, was it was it shortly before you came here, or what? Oh, in 2012? I see. Wow. Yeah, I understand things have changed quite a bit in China, right, over these last 10, 20 years. I had the opportunity to visit um, now I've forgotten exactly what year. I I spent a summer I, I spent several weeks in Beijing in um, 2007, 2007. And then um, I went back I had friends who uh, were and they were in Shanghai. 
the husband is an American. Actually, he was born in Taiwan, but he, was, he grew up here. And then he worked for an American company, but in Shanghai. And uh, I went with them to Xinjiang. So, so that was a very, very interesting experience because friends of theirs were from Singapore and And so I, I was able to meet some local leader people who they were really trying to reach out to. But it was interesting to see hear their experience and their um, their grievance really with the government right as as um, as minority. But also it was also interesting that there were people who were Chinese, but they also had reasons, right? Because because this is what Beijing creates, right? With, with the like, either you're a minority and you get subsidies, or you're Chinese and you don't. But the truth is that the Chinese do better than the minorities, right? So there was just this conflict that I didn't see that they were able to uh, resolve or address. What was that because of your wife's involvement with Colin Gong? I see. So, so, um, but I guess they were they were willing to allow you to leave. Okay. My mother. Um, uh, my mother left as a child. Right? So she she was born in 1936, and uh, because of the propaganda, they escaped from Hong Kong before they closed the border. Right, and so. Uh, when, uh, you know, when Beijing, when China was opening up, my, my father wound up being back in touch with some of his cousins in Hong Kong. No, 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 not that early. Uh, I think my, my father, uh, my father first went back, I think, in like 90, 90, 91. But then my parents both went, I think, in like 93, 94, right? And, uh, uh, yeah, my mother said that she never wants to go back again. She's, she's, uh, yeah, she's done visiting uh, China because she's so, she's so disgusted with what the CCP has done to the country. Yeah, yeah, right. So my mother talks to her grandchildren all the time about how evil communism is. But I don't think that they understand that what much of what we are much of our propaganda in the United States is communism, right? So I'll, I'll let you eat, I'll, I'll go get it.
chef, by the way, downstairs that prepares this. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful food they prepare. We have meetings here once a month, and the chefs do a fantastic job here. So, um, glad while you're continuing to eat, eat and continue to enjoy your lunch, we're going to have a musical presentation. We're going to have a musical presentation again by Rebecca Zenke. Tomorrow all the things were gone I watched for all my life And I had to start again With just my vigor and my fight I thank my lucky stars To be living here today Cause the fact still stands for freedom And they can't take that away
Is that great or what? Oh, yeah. Yeah. How does that make your digestion go on? Huh? Mm -hmm. It's going to help. I thought with that first song she sang, Donald Trump was going to walk in. <laughs> I was looking for the grand entrance. <laughs> yeah, really. Okay, please continue finishing your lunch. Um, I'm now going to introduce uh, one of our other very special members of our settlement project here in Southern California. He used to be the mayor of Downey, and uh, that is Keith McCarthy, and Keith is going to introduce some of our lunchtime speakers. Keith? Just as good as or better than Donald Trump. <laughs> I just wanted to mention, we're fortunate to have a number of elected officials here today, or formerly elected officials. I'm going to just read them off because not everyone's going to come up here. But uh, we will hear a, a welcome from Mayor George Chen of Torrance in just a moment. Also with us is Scott Ball. Uh, former Assembly Republican leader, now candidate for the 47th Congressional District. Scott, are you in the room? I am in there. <laughs> We'd like to have a couple of words from you. Uh, also, uh, Stephen Choi, mo former mayor of Irvine, where we are right now. And Stephen is also a former, former Assembly member and uh, now candidate for the 37th State Senate District. Uh, a candidate for the 29th Congressional District in Los Angeles is Benito Bernal, here with his wife. A candidate for the 73rd Assembly District, Scotty Piotr, here in uh, Irvine. Uh, past Mayor of Irvine, Christine Shea, is with us today. Christine, thank you for being here. She's here somewhere. And... Uh, Council member, a good friend of mine from the city of Downey, Hector Sosa, is here with us. Thank you for coming, Hector. And uh, the founder and chairman of the Los Angeles County Hispanic Republican Club, David Hernandez, is with yeah. us. And Mr. Voigt, uh, the mayor of... Lake Forest. Lake, Lake Forest. Forest. Scott Voigt, Lake Forest. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for being here, Scott. So, I also wanted to mention that uh, today's presentation is uh, presented courtesy of, courtesy of our sponsor, Camel Cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> One out of three doctors recommend camels, and I'd walk a mile for a camel. <laughs> Our speaker this afternoon has uh, served on the Torrance City Council since June 2018. He's continued until 2022 when he was elected as mayor of that city and currently holds that position. After emigrating from Taiwan as a very young man, uh, he lived in the South Bay since the late 1960s. He attended Carson High School, then graduated from UCLA with a degree in electrical engineering. Prior to becoming a council member, uh, he had a 33-year career with Raytheon, working on radar and electronic warfare systems for the F-14 and F-A-18 Super Hornet. George and his wife are active members at their church in Torrance. They participated in a number of overseas missions, and he and his wife have two adult children. They're married. They have two grandsons. Please join me in welcoming Mayor of Torrance, George Chen. Welcome, George. Right. Yes, sir. First of all, thank you very much for. Uh, having me speak with you, you know, it's interesting. I'll read Jack's email to me. While most meetings will present a well, most of the meeting will be presenting da 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 da, we also need a practical discussion about the importance of getting out the vote and the need to be engaged in our representative government. So I, was, mm -hmm. yeah. so I thought about that and I go, that's still kind of broad. I'm not sure what you really want me to talk about. So uh, I had a blank sheet of paper and I was taking notes down while this meeting was going on. So here it goes. This is a 
are really off the cup here. Um, you know, somebody uh, always uh, comes into our meetings and every time they talk, I feel like they are the smartest person in the room. So I'm just going to confess right now. I'm the dumbest person in the room. So let's just take that off the table. Okay? Um, no, being a sir, sir, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, somebody asked me yesterday why I decided to run for office. And I, I said, the answer is actually very short. You know, one month after I retired from Raytheon, I just told my wife I told the son to call her. That was it. And then when I started running for office, uh, the first question is, have you ever served in a city commission? No. <laughs> what makes you qualify? And I uh, pause for a second and I go, well, it's a valid question. I said, well, first generation immigrant. My father was a mechanic, blue collar worker. Um, that's how we lived our lives. When I graduated from high school. We don't spend more than we take in. We're blessed to go to college. Uh, probably one of the few people, if I look at the room here, some of you maybe, is also people who uh, graduated from college, went to work, and actually retired from that same company many years later. So anybody here has done that? Went to one company out of college and then retired out of the same company? Right? So I'm just the only one, so it's a rare thing nowadays. But it was just a sense of gratitude and feeling blessed. I think that was, maybe that was it. I, I can't, I'm not a, not very spiritually charismatic, so I'm just speaking from the heart here. And I think that's, so, I said, doesn't my life experience and my professional experience mean something? Uh, I'm just one of the community members, right? The home of a blue collar worker. Uh, worked in the industry as first half of my career as an engineer, second half of my career as a program manager. So, the program manager at Aerospace Company, some of you may be aware of, um, you have full uh, P&L responsibility. P&L meaning profit and loss. So, you own it all for the uh, financial responsibility the schedule, responsibility, uh, the risks, you own it all. If you don't, you get fired. O only in government, you cannot succeed and not get fired. <laughs> so I put something I just want to share with you as I hear, I heard some of the questions here, and uh, yes, I, I am a Christian, but uh, I think what my pastor said, after my miraculous first time I got elected to city council, um, he said, you know, your story is a little bit like, getting a little emotional here, like the, like like Esther. Mm. I did not think I was going to be in public office. Uh, I did not think I was getting elected. Actually, <laughs> there was, you know, all the statistics. All of you who are uh, professional candidates, the statistics were really against me. I had no social media. I never served as a commissioner. Um, no one on the committee know me. Like, how in the world are you going to get elected? You, know, you have no name recognition. So I had to work the hard way. I had to learn. I had to learn how to create a Facebook account. Learn how to do Instagram. To this day, I still don't have a Twitter account or X. Okay, so I, I don't know how to tweet. You know, people get on my case about it. But it was just vetting myself and just following, I guess, my... Uh, my heart, you know, you go. and uh, I think at the end of the day, I think it was a miracle of God. I'm not yeah. going to claim any credit. Yeah. However, yeah. even my buddy Felix down there who came with me, we worked very hard. Mm -hmm. It's not one of those things that we just prayed and just assumed things will happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? We need to be responsible, yeah. just like in our professional career. You got to work hard. You don't expect a promotion just because you sat in the chair for 30 years. Right? Yeah. You really need to work hard. Yes. So the, the reason I'm here today, I think, is because there is an element of the miracle of God. 
Even when I ran for the mayor's seat, there was no way statistically I should have been elected. Because the, my opponent had probably out endorsed me by about three to one, you know. I know you don't like these names, you know, from Ted Lou, Maxine Waters, you know, <laughs> Albert Zucci. You win. Right? <laughs> I mean, no one used me, in, uh, endorsed me, even when I think that well-known conservatives in the South Bay, if you just watch the history, somehow they all kind of shied away from me. And maybe they thought there was no way I could win, and uh, statistically, I should not have, probably. No, uh, they all raise me. But I think that some of the elements, maybe, is there's an element of a miracle of God. I think the other thing is, I went and shared my values. I think there's something about values. I think a lot of questions here was, you know, are, yes, God had a part in it. But when we're campaigning, not everybody is a Christian. The city of Torrance is about 40% Democrats. There's no way I'm going to win a seat, you know, that way. We need the crossover votes. So I, I understand some of the, your responses here. We will not win a seat unless we get crossover votes. And we need to stop talk to the everyday person in the language they understand. Yes. It's got to be yes. C-spot run. They need to understand what your values are and what your message is within 10 seconds. Mm. They, they will know if you're authentic or not. And maybe they saw some of that authenticity. Because I really don't have to run for office. I know a lot of people threaten me, even nowadays, you know, you better do this and do this, or else I'm not going to vote for you. And, and I'm just chuckling in my mind, and I'm just thinking, you really don't have to threaten me, because I'm actually serving at my pleasure. And I don't really have to do this. So my, now I'm going to get ready to get, for my get off the stage, comments and things. I think that some of the key things I share with Felix, even driving here today, and I wish my own church would do more, is every faith-based organization, whichever faith you are, you know, you're always trying to bring people to your faith. Yes. And that's your mission field. But I believe at this day and age, elected office, um, being in the positions of academics, or board agencies like Water, A Q and D, is the new mission field in the United States. I would challenge all of you to go back to your homes. Think of the United States as the new mission field. Because what my pastor said that to me is unbeknownst to me that God was preparing me for thirty three years for such a time as this. And we see that Every elected office. For the last 20 years, the frog has been boiled. Mm -hmm. Because folks with values different from ours has been moving into teaching positions, yeah. high school, yeah. higher learning like Harvard, the, the big wig schools, Berkeley, right? And then they make the decisions what our kids are going to be learning. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. I go to conferences with council members and mayors all over the United States. And I see a lot of people who got in the office and I'm thinking, there's no way these people should be serving. Yes. Yeah. However, right. however, they stood up and took a risk. So my, my get off the stage moment is should you have that calling, and should your life and skills match, do dare to step up and make your legacy count. Thank you. Whoa. Mayor George Chen, thank you. Scott, if you can make your way forward, let's welcome the next congressman for California's 47th uh, Congressional District, Mr. Scott Bow. All right, I got to cram 20 minutes into five minutes, so I'm going to talk fast and furious, and uh, and then when the hook comes out, I guess I'll leave. But uh, last time I was filmed at an event like this, I the question was presented to me: What was the biggest threat to religious liberty in this country? And I said, wokeism is uh, the biggest threat. And I said that we survived all these wars, uh, but wokeism is what kept 
our Christian, our people out of church, and the wars didn't keep us out of church. And of course, what did the media say? They said, I said, wokeism was worse than all the wars we ever fought. So I'm always careful about when somebody's filming me, make sure they film the whole thing so we get everything in context. So what's the context of why we're here? I'm going to go back 200 years before Christ. Okay, i got to talk fast to get to the present, right? Okay, there's a gentleman named Polybius. You ever heard of Polybius? Uh, he was a Greek fellow that he wrote about why the Roman Republic was so devastating to the Greek Empire. And he said that the key to the genius and the genius of the Roman Republic was the separation of powers. And he wrote about their, uh, their senate and, of course, their, uh, their uh, consuls and then the, uh, the assemblies they had. Um, and, and he wrote about that was the genius of it. And then Montesquieu, I'm going to fast forward, in 1600, um, that's 1800 years forward, right? He wrote about Polybius and he wrote about the separation of powers and he wrote about the genius of that and why it was so important. Then you fast forward another 150 years or so and our founding fathers, they quoted Polybius, they quoted Montesquieu and in the Federalist Papers, and by the way, how many of you are Federalists in here? How many of you are Anti-Federalists? How many of you are both? I am both. I am both. Let me tell you why I am both. The Federalists established our Constitution. The Anti-Federalists established our Bill of Rights right here. You needed both and the condition for the admission of New York and another state, I think South Carolina or Georgia, was the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights are important. So just because this word anti-federalist is there. Don't think it's a bad thing. The, the, the anti-federalist brought us the Bill of Rights that are important to our freedoms, our religious liberty in this country. And so we're, we're back to the Founding Fathers, and the Federalists were, were talking about uh, Polybius and Montesquieu, and I think in Federalist 51, and they talk about why it's so important to have the separation of powers because of the, you know, the instinct of man to be corrupt if he's all-powerful and all that. So... So we have to have that. And what have we done in this country? We've destroyed the separation of powers. How have we done that? Through the administrative state. We have over a million regulations on the books. The, the administrative state, whether you're the IRS, the SEC, the whatever three-letter agency you are, they make the law, they interpret the law, and they enforce the law. And it's a faceless bureaucrat that does all of that. And it's taken more of our freedoms away than you know. And so what I want to do is encourage people to go back uh, and actually read the Constitution. Read the purpose of it. How about earmarks? You guys, earmarks good or bad, right? Okay. Congress has a duty to, to or authority to spend the money, right? But most members of Congress don't even know what Section 1 or, or Article 1, Section 8 is. Article 1, Section 8 tells you about all of the jurisdictional authority that Congress has. So if you're going to do earmarks, it better be related to the Constitution. Yes. Otherwise, it's giving money away, and now we're borrowing money from the yes. Chinese to give money away for projects that the federal government shouldn't be involved in. That's right. So that's, that's what constitutional conservatism is all about. But let me back up one little bit from there. The Constitution tells us how to do government, and it's a brilliant document if we follow it. But the Declaration tells us the why, and if you know the why, the how is much easier. So the Declaration of Independence, who can quote it for me? Who can start it? So, I'll, okay, I'll fast forward to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. How about that? That's good. You got that? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What was the pursuit of happiness? What did our founding fathers mean was the pursuit of happiness? It was the pursuit of a virtuous life because you couldn't have happiness unless you were virtuous. How many of you have done something that wasn't virtuous? <laughs> How'd you feel about that? You didn't feel very good, but if you pursue virtue, so I'm going to go back to the mayor of Torrance here. Why is he running? It's a virtuous thing what he's doing. He's trying to restore order. Like Nehemiah, he's trying to rebuild the walls in front of his own house there. And the point is, when you follow that calling, you're pursuing courage, you're pursuing goodness, and you are happy. You are fulfilled right now. So that's what we all need to do. Be engaged and be happy because we're pursuing virtue. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's the next eight words that I want you to focus on. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted. In other words, the purpose of government, the why of government, is to secure rights that government does not give you. Yes. Understand, these rights come from God, nature, and nature's God. And that's the purpose of our government. And if you've lost that purpose, you don't belong in office, right? Yes. You were talking to me about some of those people who don't belong in office, right? Yes. No, yeah, you're the mayor there, right? <laughs> so the whole point here 
is you should support people who want to follow the Constitution and understand the purpose of government. And once you understand that, and once they get there, again, it's the why. Make sure they know the why of government, and then the how is kind of automatic. And so what are we doing in our, our campaign here today? It's like two years ago, I ran against Katie Porter. She, she outspent me $29 million to $3 million. I thought it was funny to hear her complain about being outspent by Adam Schiff. Uh, yeah. I thought it was funny to hear her complaining about being smeared by Adam Smith. But, <laughs> but we're all glad to see her go, one way or another. Right? <laughs> the point is, she's unemployed now, and we're all happy about that. Right? Hey. So, so what I want to leave you with here is that um, she did, she outspent me quite a bit. We got really close. We were hoping for a big red wave from the east that, that didn't come, but, but we're going to win it this time. Why? Things are so different. Last year I had 10 months to campaign, and I did well to raise $3 million. Uh, this year I've had two years to campaign off of another full year of campaigning. So I'm out in the community, and i got to tell you, Christina and Steve, Irvine is a complex city. It's yeah. jurisdictionally rich. It's ethnically diverse. It's fantastic. It's beautiful. I've eaten pig intestines and chicken's oh. feet and uh, um, pig's ears. I mean, I, I, oh I, I, I go to the, uh, uh, the festivals, they're fun, the, the Nuru's and the, uh, uh, what was it, last weekend, the Holy Fest, right? All yeah. the colors. I mean, this is a beautiful city. It's diverse, but like you were saying, we have to get out in the streets. We have to talk to people where they are and tell them about our values. And I've been doing that over and over again for two years, and we are making progress in all of these different communities. Uh, equally important, I'm, I'm number one in fundraising in this race. Uh, that's, 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 that's a lot better than being outspent $29 million to $3 million. We just came out of the primary. I have $1.7 million left over and now up at $2 million. And um, my opponent, they, what's his name, Dave Mann? Yeah, somebody, we, some people call him DUI Dave, but you know, that's a, it's a different problem. But, but he's running and he's, uh, he had about 150000 left over from the primary. So, and listen, the Democrats will spend whatever it takes against me. I get that. But we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna work harder. We're going to spend more. We're going to have more resources available to us. The Club for Growth endorses economic conservatives. They're behind me. All right. um, the uh, Americans for Prosperity are looking to, to come in and help. Uh, APAC's looking to come in and help. Uh, who else? Uh, con Congressional Leadership Fund. The point is, the, um, uh, the national groups, they smell blood in the water. They smell Democrat blood in the water. This is the number one pickup seat for Republicans in the country, because they smell blood in the water. But let me tell you this, it's not the national groups that have put us over the finish line. It's groups like you. It's, it's groups that are local here. It's the uh, local folks, uh, the Lincoln Club, New Majority. Um, what is it? We, are, we love Costa, we are Costa Mesa. I was out there this morning walking a precinct with them. It, it's like, it is the local groups because the people are fed up. They're tired, they know we're losing our country, and they know this battle needs to be fought by courageous people. So I'm here to say, Please stay engaged, be courageous, yes. finance my campaign, um, and, and God bless America. Oh, wait, 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 okay. So if you want to help, uh, ballforcongress.com, it's really easy. But let me, uh, let me, I want to give you my phone Ball number, ballforcongress.com, or my phone number, 714-470-4700. And if you call me or text me, I'll respond, usually with a request for money. But hey, I'll still respond to you, right? 714-470-4700. Um, hey, thank you for your participation. Thank you for your love for this country. God bless you. Thank you. So Scott mentioned uh, Stephen Choi. We're in his backyard here. Thank you for having us in Irvine. Stephen is a candidate for the 37th State Senate District. Would you like to say a few words? Can you take a picture? <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Stephen Choi. I want to uh, welcome everyone because uh, you are many of you are, I, I, I see out of town. So. Two former Irvine mayors, Chris Nashe and myself, I would like to extend a uh, warm welcome to you. And uh, I really appreciate uh, two wonderful professors uh, uh, that we have heard in the morning. Uh, 
uh, I felt like uh, I was uh, back to the classroom. And uh, this morning, uh, when I hear all that uh, theories uh, that uh, we are now uh, learning and how we can apply to our practical uh, reality, especially in political arena, uh, because uh, as a first generation immigrant uh, who came at my adult life for my first job, and uh, Against my will, I was pushed into politics. <coughs> People kicked me into politics. Uh, just uh, uh, it took for two years, uh, and uh, whatever Mayor George Chan was uh, speaking about, his odds getting elected just uh, applied the same way to me. Huh. Um, <clears throat> For 24 years, I think it should be a kind of a, a record, even not only minority politician, but uh, even uh, uh, any politician consecutively serving for 24 years. Mm -hmm. I started uh, um, as a school board member in 1998 here and uh, continuously got elected uh, uh, through a city council and a mayor and uh, state assemblyman and uh, I came out of my uh, retirement and running for uh, state senate wow. and uh, again uh, for whatever reason including my own party all the leaders rejected me you are not the right one and 99% uh, of uh, all the leadership, uh, including the state senate leadership, uh, even assembly, everybody went against me. But uh, God chose me to represent the report. <laughs> and the people have hope that uh, we can win the seat. We all either current politicians or, or former uh, elected officials. Ideally, we are trying to create a utopian city, utopian state, and utopian country. And that's the reason my question a while ago was that our lecturers uh, uh, should have applied their theories uh, uh, to Democratic Party Foundation and uh, Republican uh, Foundation. Where we stand, where our, why we are uh, trying to, uh, among our Republican Party members, uh, to elect uh, Republicans. In our state of California right now, a state is uh, uh, in, a, in a dire, Trouble. So many millions of people are packing and leaving, mm. and they don't even know why they are leaving. Mm. Because everything is so difficult. Mm. You know, crime rates, uh, high cost of living, and uh, too much regulations, anti-business policies, and uh, why are these uh, all the problems I've created? because of a one party ruling supermajority. Yes. Yes. And we gotta have a good balance of power. Yes. And uh, no matter what party you belong to, are there any Democratic Party members here? I mean, this lecture should be open to everybody. Why no Democratic Party members are here? I mean, uh, they are the ones uh, to be here and uh, listen to and uh, to create the, the, the utopia in our country, in our state, uh, yes. we need to understand the principles of where God, how, why God has created the United States of America. Yes. And, and we need to work toward creating the utopian country, utopian state together. That's the reason I'm rerunning out of my retirement uh, and then I lost job as a 
babysitter to my grand <laughs> grand <laughs> grand <laughs> and the campaigner and vote for me. Thank you. Okay, let's elect Stephen. 37 State Senate District. Let's create utopia. Uh, Scott, if I could just have you say a few words about your campaign, Scott Ipiotter. He's a candidate for the State Assembly. Thank you. Can I, can I go up front or you, you want me to keep uh, it short? I'm trying to shrink the time here, so, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, tall, so I'm, a, I'm a former Newport Beach City Councilman. And I thought I, like Mr. Chen, I thought I'd served my time. And I finished that in 18, and I've been involved, like you guys, but there was this race coming up, in this case the assembly race in the 73rd, which is Costa Mesa, Irvine, and Tustin, and nobody of any stature was stepping up to run against this incumbent Democrat, and it just bugged me. So, you know, I, I like to tell people that, well, I, I take a little test, okay, how many people know who Benjamin Rush is? I take it you all went to public school. <laughs> so he was one of our founding fathers. He's considered the father of American medicine. He had people, he made a great statement I like. He said, people accuse me of being a aristocrat or a Democrat, because I'm neither, I'm a Christocrat. Uh -huh. And I kind of rephrase that a little bit. And I, sell it, and I tell people that I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm a conservative, I'm an, and I'm a Republican, in that order. Mm. And it's important that it's that order. So I look at it as a calling, like, Mr. Chen, and I think that uh, nobody was stepping up for the 73rd, and so I stepped up. I, I filed my papers literally the Monday before they were due, and uh, I won, I beat my Republican opponent two to one, but there's an incumbent Democrat, Cotty Petrie Norris, who is a very, very ultra-liberal candidate, and this is a district... Carpet What's that? Carpet taker. Yeah, she's a carpetbagger. She lives in Laguna Beach, but she wants to represent us. So she's got a little apartment in, in Irvine. Uh, my district is totally within Stevens District. My district is totally within Scott Baugh's district. So if you work and vote in my district, it's a three for you. You'll have all three of us out. So uh, I encourage you, one of the things that I'm trying to do in organizing and running my election is I'm trying to get school board candidates, city council candidates from my three cities to work together with me I want to help them get elected. I can provide electronics and digital kind of services that they can afford in their little campaigns. They can afford, they know the, the, the people in the district, they know the volunteers. So you guys, like I stepped up in the assembly, you need to step up for school boards, particularly, water boards, city council races, or get somebody to do that. And then, like I said, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to unite all those candidates to run together and use the resources that we have to win as many of those seats as possible, to help Stephen, to help Scott, and to help those school board and city council candidates. So thanks for coming today. It shows that you guys are committed to the cause, and I hope that you'll consider being a candidate for November or finding a candidate in your city. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Taxfighter.com is his website. Taxfighter.com. Let's win the trifecta. Uh, Scotty P. Otter, Mr. Choi and Scott Powell. Yes. I'd like to hear from uh, Benito Bernal and David Hernandez. Benito, you're going to have to tell a very short story, uh, but you have a great story. I'm going to come up to the front. Okay, so I don't know if this can be done really, really short, but I'm going to try. So just look, I'm not going to talk about the politics. I'm not going to talk about my race. Obviously, everything that you've heard so far is exactly the reason why I'm here. What I need you to understand is I want to try to connect the dots, especially after listening to the presentations that were made today. I am a former strategist and organizer for the Latino Democratic Party. I am a former elected official vice president for SEIU Local 99 that represents classified employees in the school districts, many of the school districts. Very powerful position that I held. Now, the reason why I share that with you is because I want you to understand where I'm going and where we're leading with all of this. So I'm going to tell you the strategy that was shared that I taught the Democrats and the Latinos. It was called the box. And the reason for the box was four or five issues that we repeated over and over and over. And that was to, so, that, so that every candidate, everybody is speaking on the same issues and it sticks, it sticks into people's minds. What happened over the years was that the Democrats and the unions decided to use it and create lies and repeat the lies over and over and over. Yeah. So when I was vice president, let's go back 19 years ago for SEIU Local 99, 
I helped expose the corruption within the unions. I was a Democrat, and Republicans were asking me, why does our money have to go behind, always behind Democratic candidates? I said, you're absolutely right. You should have a right to have your money go wherever it wants. Obviously, my executive board didn't want to hear it. The International didn't want to hear it. So I did more investigations. I started doing more investigations. I found a lot of corruption. I exposed SEIU. I had the entire executive board removed facing federal charges. I had a city councilman, Martin Lovo, from the city of Los Angeles, who was forced to resign because his money, his hands, were also in the pot. But here's what I want to share with you. I know we don't have much time. I want you to hear from David, good partner of mine for 20 years. Five things that they wanted to do, actually six. Here's what the unions wanted to do. We talked about God. We talked about God being the center of everything that we do, correct? So what the union strategy was, number one, was to take the Bibles, first take God out of the schools. We covered that. Not only did they want to remove Bibles from the schools, but it was to remove Bibles from the hotels as well. Because when somebody's suffering, where do they usually end up? In a hotel, what do they reach for? The Bible. Okay, those are two things that they wanted to remove right there. Then they were going to go after parental rights, religious freedoms, after the hearts, minds, and souls of our children. They wanted to change the definition of the rainbow. So when I got wind of that 19 years ago, I went very vocal, very public, exposing what they were trying to do. But here's the interesting part. I'm a part of Churches in Action, which is an international national organization. When I spoke in front of the churches, Catholic Christian churches, with hundreds of pastors and priests there, 19 years ago, warning them of these things to come, mm. warning them of the strategies of the unions in the Democratic Party, yes. I was kicked out of the churches. Wow. Wow. Think about that. So when you talk about the churches, how the churches had turned their back, they turned their back on God. They were refusing to do it, but you got to ask why. Why did they do that? Because what I realized later throughout the years is many of these churches, follow the money. Many of these churches receive money from government agencies. So if they speak up against the Democratic Party and the unions, what happens to their money? So... There was five issues that we were going to deal with as a Democratic Party of Latinos. Illegal immigration, gang violence, teenage dropout, taking pregnancy, and the abuse in the welfare system. Destroying the nuclear family, keeping our young kids in, uh, 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 in need of, 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 the, of government, and let our kids keep killing each other. What they did was instead of, instead of doing something about it and addressing the issues, they found ways to exploit the sufferings of our community. So follow the nonprofit organizations within your district, follow the money, see they are connected to, and you're gonna see that it all leads back to the Democratic Party. Yeah. So I'm gonna leave you with this, because I need you to hear from David. We put a plan together 16 years ago. I'm gonna let David talk a little bit more about that plan, you're gonna hear it here. I come from a district that is plus 26 Democrat. No one gave me a chance to make it to the runoff. But because of my history, because of my track record, because of my involvement in my community, name recognition, which you name, with $7,000, I made it to the runoff. In the first 26 districts. But I need your help. I did bring some contribution envelopes with me today. I'm going to leave some up here. All right? I'm going to leave them here. And if it's in your heart to help me get this message out, because as a former union vice president, I can flip the unions. I've been doing it. My wife and I have been knocking on 300 doors a day. 300 doors a day, Democrat, Independent, Republican. And we are flipping them as fast as you can imagine. But I cannot, I cannot knock on 85,000 doors. I'm going to need your help. So I hope you take that into consideration. You can go to BernalforCongress.com. BernalforCongress.com where you can make a donation. Thank you so much. God bless you. And God bless America. Thank you. You know, what a very informative, enlightening scary morning we've had you know and that's the why uh so some of you know me as a founder of the hispanic republican club <coughs> others as a talk show host on am870 the answer Both. and um but recently within the past six months i was elected to the california republican party executive board All right. so i represent the california republican party and believe me, we have a lot to overcome. So I'm the regional vice chair representing all of Los Angeles County. 
So that's 10 million people, people, 88 cities. And a county central committee that is in dire need of help. There are 24 state assembly districts in LA County. You know that there's two assembly districts with no one on the central committee? Right. So when an injured police officer who decided to step up and run for state assembly and also started the resiliency project which addresses mental health problems for law enforcement, called me and said, David, there's no one on the central committee in my district. How can I get an endorsement if there's no one there to give me the referral? The position that I hold now, I look at it and we talked about responsibility. I have a responsibility to every candidate in this room, to the one million re registered Republicans in Los Angeles County, 99% of them have no idea that the Republican Party even exists and that's not their fault. The responsibility rests with us. <laughs> That is actually the good news. I first stepped into the political arena in 2002 when I ran for Congress. Nothing has changed in 22 years with regards to an infrastructure within the county. That's why I accepted this responsibility. Because we are building the infrastructure, we are educating individual central committee members as to what it means to be a central committee member. Not only what are your duties, but what are your responsibilities and what are your opportunities to be a central committee member. People are stepping up all over. They want to do something, but they need the guidance and the direction. And so we're holding regional meetings, training sessions, central committee, US, uh, central committee 101. We have one this month in the San Fernando Valley where we're training seven central committees. We have one in Linwood next month where we're treating all of the central committees from Long Beach to East Los Angeles and the ADs on either side. And then we'll be moving over to the Torrance area and the west side and San Gabriel Valley. So in order to do that, in order to fund those individual central committees, and showing them what they could be doing, come up with a budget. So I've assumed the responsibility of raising money to fund them directly so that they can fulfill their obligations. So I have some cards over there. So I created the uh, LA Regional Empowerment Fund. We have a website with the same thing. People are willing to invest in the future because it is so dire. You know, we're sitting here right now and I, you know, I wanna thank Mark uh, for being such a uh, uh, very accommodating host. I mean, what a great facility. Uh, Mark told me that his uh, sister, uh, Marion, listens to my show every Saturday night, so we're gonna give her a shout out for being here tonight. So I need your help. I need your help in raising the funds in order to fund the individual central committees. And I'll leave some envelopes and things like there. But you know, we're sitting here and right now we just saw the news that Iran is raining missiles on Israel. The war starting. You know, these are very dangerous times. And I know that I believe we are up to the fight. And there are so many out there that are up to the fight, but they're waiting to hear what can they do. We're the Republican Party for those of you that are Republican. You know, we talked about the founding documents those inalienable rights. But what did it take for those inalienable rights to be given to everyone? It took the abolitionists. It took Abraham Lincoln. It took the Republicans. When Susan B. Anthony was arrested for voting, when women didn't have the right to vote, who did she vote for? Not a Democrat. She voted for a Republican and was arrested for it. Right now, we have about 30% of the Republicans in Los Angeles County voting. That is unacceptable. We don't need all of them. But if we get the voting of the 65% and our candidates in LA County will transform Los Angeles County from an anchor around the neck of the Republicans in California 
to an engine. And that rising tide will impact all boats. You know, very perilous times, but the opportunity is there. And so I want to thank you all for all that you continue to do. And Keith, you know, uh, I love that 710 quarter. And so we'll, we'll be in Linwood next month. Thank you. Very good. David Hernandez, thank you very much. Thank you for your work. I'm going to turn this back over to our wonderful after ceremony, Ray Martin. Thank you very much, Keith. Um, one, oh, did she leave? Oh, okay. Christina Shea, I wanted to just have her stand up and recognize her. She's the, uh, there she is. Christina Shea is the former two-time mayor of Irvine. Let's have a little round of applause for Christina. Thank you, Christina. So we're going to continue on. Again, you know, are you planning to stay here till 8 o'clock? Okay, we're going to try to get you out here by 3.30, so I'm going to keep moving things along here. But, you know, when, when uh, Dr. Kaufman was talking about Adam Schiff, and about how many lies he told. Remember, he was on television for three years, lying on CNN to the American public. But it reminded me of a little story. There was a story about a guy who died, and he went to heaven, and he met Peter at the golden at the gates of heaven. And he looked at St. Peter, and behind St. Peter on the wall were some clocks. And one of the clocks, underneath it, had the label, Mother Teresa. And he said to St. He asked St. Peter, what's, what's the purpose of the clock there? And St. Peter said, oh, uh, that's Mother Teresa. Well, you know, every time someone lies, the hands go around. But the hands are frozen there because Mother Teresa never told a lie in her life. And they said, well, what's that other one? He said, that's Abraham Lincoln. Now, it moved a little bit because he only t told two lies, two lies in his lifetime. He goes, wow, that's amazing. He said, where's Joe Biden's clock? <laughs> St. Peter goes, oh, that's in Jesus' office. He's using it as a ceiling fan. <laughs> okay, let's welcome up again Dr. David Burgess. <laughs> All right, I'll try not to tell too many lies. <laughs> Okay. I'm providing the shallow entertainment. <laughs> These guys are the heavy guys. So, we looked at the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution. Now we're in the middle of the woke revolution. My son actually tells me, you know, woke used to be a term that they, they embraced, but now they don't like it, so it's, I guess, the social, revol social justice revolution, but... So, whatever we call it, um, that's where we are, right? So, and I think Frank alluded to this in the response to his question earlier. It's different. It's not the exact same thing. A lot of people are calling it, you know, Marxism or stuff, but it's really not. Um, so, the French Revolution offered a rationalist vision. We saw that based on liberty, equality, and fraternity. These are the highest ideals of enlightenment thought, right? So, and the Russian Revolution offered a materialist vision based, uh, and their motto was peace, land, and bread. Now, that was the Bolshevik slogan, representing the material well-being promised by the revolution. They didn't get any land, they didn't get much bread, and they certainly got no peace. Um, so, these are the highest ideals of materialist thought. So the woke revolution, as we know, it promises DEI, right? Diversity, equity, and inclusion. So what's the full philosophical basis for DEI? So I don't know how many of you are familiar with this term. Uh, it's one that's you know very popular in uh, academic circles, but. Uh, it's called postmodernism. So after the collapse of the Soviet Union, sort of the class-based analysis of Marxism went out of favor. But the, the race and gender theorists, and we're going to learn much more about them, and you're already uh, dealing with uh, their work now in, your, in, our, in our country's life. But, so they replaced the class-based critique of Marxism as the cutting edge of radicalism. 
and they replaced Marxism with a new philosophical basis, postmodernism. So, postmodernism, okay, this, this was, most of these slides are actually used as teaching tools. This is um, not one they would use, right? But, uh, <laughs> uh, but it, it does point to a little problem. Uh, anyway, we'll talk about this later. But uh, postmodernism, they're not really atheistic. They're what I would call post-atheistic. They not only reject God, but they reject truth itself. Yeah. Right? The rejection of truth is based on the theory of deconstruction, which I'll explain in a, in, a, in a few minutes here. Deconstruction questions the very idea that there are any fixed meanings. Right? Meaning is always uh, relative. It's always something deferred or you know, constantly changing. It's, the, it's a really a pure form of relativism. And without this stable sense of meaning, there can be no truth. Right? So, not only is there no God, but there are no universal truths. No religious truth, no philosophical truth. And this even includes rationality and science. They're uh, anti-enlightenment. Uh, that's why I say postmodernism isn't, they're not militantly atheists, they're indifferent. They're indifferent to the very question of God uh, or truth. Uh, in fact, uh, this is one of the key figures. Actually, he in, invented the deconstruction, uh, Jacques Derrida, and um, he, he, um, yeah, he says things like language is all subjective, and the real meaning of the text is unknown. Right. So. Uh, and he also says that uh, without uh, truth, there is no God, right? Yeah. But I would say it's equally true that without, uh, excuse me, he says that, with, that he says that there is no truth without God. That, I'm sorry, let me restate that. He says there's no truth without God. God is the foundation for truth. But since they reject God, that means there's no truth either, right? It's equally true that there is no truth without God, right? So, so what are they? What, what is truth then? Well, they use a term called meta narrative, right? And, and, and what is that? It just means it's a story we tell about our stories, right? It's a story we tell ourselves about the meaning and goal of life and of history. So. If the if truth is just a story, where does it originate? Uh, this is actually a picture of another uh, French postmodernist uh, theorist. His name is Foucault, Michel Foucault. And uh, so, what we understand as truths are just expressions and extensions of power. That's what Foucault says. Uh, knowledge is produced by the powerful, and it serves the purpose of maintaining their privilege and power. Foucault refers to this as power knowledge. <coughs> knowledge, whatever else it is, is always an expression of power. Right? So that's how he writes power knowledge. Right? There is no power relationship without the correlative constitution of a field of knowledge. Right? There's no power without knowledge. There's no knowledge without power. That's basically what he says. There are two sides of the same point. So I just want to point out there's so there's a there's a this is there is some similarity here with Marx right but there's also a, a key difference right so this is actually not from Foucault but uh, somebody uh, interpreting him so the historical formation here well, you know in the beginning like the revolutions we studied before were, were a rejection of feudalism the form of power was considered domination and the forms of struggle were ethnic and religious. Uh, in Marxism, capitalism was the historical formation and exploitation, which they use a lot, and class struggle is the form of struggle. Right? So in the modern world, or the postmodern world, really, the form of power is, they consider, subjection. So it's in every institution. Foucault writes all these uh, books about uh, the history of like the birth of the clinic uh, and um, uh, the birth of the prison, 
things like this, uh, social institutions, right, orphanages. And um, so the form of power here is identity struggle or local resistance. Don't worry, I mean, we'll, we'll go into more what this means in a few minutes, it'll become more clear. But it begins with the rejection of Marxism, right? And uh, Marx had believed that inequality and oppression could be eliminated once the proletariat came to recognize its historic mission and overthrow the capitalists. But Foucault rejects that. It's just another story, another meta narrative. Okay. So, again, just to reiterate here uh, uh, power is productive, it creates things. This is his contrast between his notion of power and Marx's notion of power. And power comes from below. It's not dualistic in a relationship between the powerful and the powerless, but it's in every relationship. So it's just so many strategies. Right? Uh, okay. All right. Well, I think we'll see more how this plays into the woke ideology going forward. So just like I said, Foucault, I mean, just like I said, Derrida's philosophy was completely relativistic. There is no truth. There is no meaning. Uh, Foucault also uh, shares that same relativism, but applied to history. Uh, he rejects the idea that history has any goal at all, no purpose. Actual history is just a series of events. Uh, I don't know if they're entirely random, but they lead in no particular direction. So, and again, it, it includes in a moral relativism. All beliefs and all opinions are equally good, or I would argue, therefore, equally bad. And uh, all true statements, worldviews, and theories are equally true, or equally bad. So power is, is everywhere. It's in every relationship. It's in every institution. Power is not concentrated in two classes. That's the most important thing. It's a clear distinction with, with Marx. And it's more of a grid. What does that mean? Okay. All right. Please study this. This is, uh, <laughs> this is his, his uh, understanding of how power operates. All right, well, it's a little complicated, uh, so maybe just give, I'll give you a quick gloss on it. Uh, uh, there's a power grid. We're all part of a grid. Think of, think of it like a, a grid, and you have a place in the grid, right? And then, so the power is dispersed throughout society, but not equally, of course. Uh, some have more, some have less. But it can't be tamed, it can't be eliminated. It simply has to be resisted or wielded. So the only way to fight the power of the privilege is either to resist it or to fight it with the counter power. Right? So this means that there's not like two classes of oppressor and oppressed, but in every relationship there's these potential. And I think that's what's key and important here and what's different from Marxism. Right? Uh, whatever else Marxism was, uh, but they did have a utopian vision that we could get out of this problem. For Foucault, there's no getting out of it. You're, you're caught in it, and you're just part of the, this power grid that's controlling you. Right? So, and they say, therefore, human nature is socially constructed. Right? It means that whatever we are, um, whatever we are as a, you know, whatever our gender is, or what's human, or what race or ethnicity, it's all determined by the social grid, by society, right? Um, so, uh, human nature, it's like, in a sense, there's a correlation to Marxism. Human nature is a function of social conditions. But for Marx, it was just class, you know, and it was determined by the economy. But for Foucault, it, it's, it's in everything. Okay. So, uh, again, this is a diagram. This is the, these are the kind of diagrams they used to explain. Um, let me just give you a quick gloss. Social constructionism means that your identity is determined by your place in the power grid. It's endlessly fluid, depending on the forces acting upon you. 
This is what the postmodernists mean when they say our identities are socially constructed. There is no stable or fixed you. You are constantly being constructed by the forces of power around you. Right. One little editorial comment. I, maybe you can see this. It's actually a little more pernicious <laughs> than what went before. But I think we'll, we'll, we'll go into that a little more. So to, to say that uh, race, for example, is socially constructed means my identity is based on the social meaning people have attached to it, as we see in the first slide. It's not based on any immutable characteristic uh, that I possess. Nothing to do with me at all, but it's assigned to me by society. So in, in, in many respects, it has less to do with skin pigment than it has to do with my place assigned to me in the power grid. That's what essentially postmodernism is saying. Same thing applies to gender. Right? Society imposes definition uh, on me of what it means to be a boy or girl, a man or woman, and expects me to conform to it. Okay, that's the um, that's the philosophical basis, right, of the, the gender theory, which we'll be looking at in a minute. I call this the founding myth. You know, we saw before, like, Rousseau has his founding myth of the noble savage, and Marx has his founding myth of historical materialism, of primitive communism. Uh, this is like, before everything else, this is what is. Right? Uh, there's no truth. Everything is relative. It's all just narrative stories that we tell each other. And all identity is socially constructed. I call it a myth in that it's the unquestioned first principle behind postmodernism. By myth, I mean these ideas don't need to be argued or demonstrated. They're just simply asserted. Uh, they're the founding principles, and, uh, and, and they're the basis on which the, the woke ideology exists in which they view the world. But it's not yet an ideology, uh, an actionable political agenda. So Derrida and Foucault were like prominent figures in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. They, that's when they did their writing. Um, and actually, Foucault died from AIDS. But, um, they, uh, and I can tell you, in, in, in the academic institutions at the time, there was an understanding. This was kind of pessimistic. <laughs> like, where did this go? Right? It wasn't a political agenda. It wasn't even an ideology yet. But something happened. Right. After the collapse of communism, the race and gender uh, theorists had begun uh, as essentially Marxists. But they transitioned from being Marxists to postmodernists. And we're going to see what that looks like here. Um, so, again, let, let me point out that as with the French revolutionaries and the Bolsheviks, philosophy itself does not make revolution. It takes an ideology and a political program. So beginning in the 1990s and 2000s, postmodern philosophy was adopted by the race and gender theorists who had previously been Marxist. So this is Kimberly Crenshaw. She's a leading figure in that transition. She's the person who came up with the idea of interse intersectionality, which we will uh, be looking at in a minute. So she was one of the ones that began to turn this postmodern philosophy into an ideology. This is Judith Butler. Uh, she uh, was a leading, is a leading gender theorist, and like the CRT people, the critical race theory people, uh, she replaced class-based critiques of Marxism and adopted postmodern philosophy as the basis for a new revolutionary ideology. Butler was and is a key figure in gender theory and also in queer theory. Uh, her book, Gender Trouble, was a seminal work in promoting this. So I've actually had an opportunity to attend seminars with some of these people um, in my studies. Okay. So as we've seen, postmodernism, they rejected the Enlightenment. They rejected truth. They rejected universals. It meant that they rejected objective truth and science. Uh, 
Uh, it's so odd, actually, a little side comment, because you have one group of uh, progressives arguing that, uh, oh, you guys aren't scientific. And the other group is arguing, well, what, you know, science is just a bunch of fairy tales, right? So anyway, it's, it's not always, it's not always consistent. So uh, they rejected objective truth and enlightenment culture. And they, they claim then, especially the race and gender theorists, uh, that the enlightenment culture is oppressive to marginalized groups. Uh, so in the absence of objective truth as a standard, right, what did they adopt? It was my experience. And, and my experience is the ground of woke ideology. And the truth of their experience is, they say, that they feel oppressed, and therefore it exists, because they experience it. Right? So truth, this is, you hear this a lot these days, that truth then is replaced with, oh, this is my truth. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You've heard that, right? My truth. Right? Which you can't argue with, right? so therefore they win. That's the point. This is actually a new book that's come out. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I will be soon, I hope. Uh, he says, uh, this is uh, Mark Goldblatt, uh, this is like the new cogito, right? I feel, therefore I am. <laughs> and this is like what woke subjectivism is. Right? No, it's, 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 it's clever. I'm going to have to read this. So let's go over what are some of the elements of the woke ideology. Uh, the first one I'd point out uh, is um, standpoint theory. So standpoint means that, uh, again, remember, we're in this Foucauldian power grid. So where you are in the grid the the, you know, will determine your experience. And what you experience determines what you know. Right? It, and it's really not any more complicated than that. Um, you know, whether you agree with that or not. But that's, so it's, it's the position from which you view the world, right? from which you experience the world. And um, so this is the framework now for analyzing um, you know, the viewpoint one holds based on the social location. Right? So this theory actually originated uh, uh, with Nancy Hartsock, who's again somebody I studied with. She was originally a Marxist, but uh, this was adopted uh, and adapted by the uh, by the woke ideologists, uh, by the race and gender folks. I say she began to move more in that direction as the as the intellectual climate changed. So standpoint theory. Here's here's the important thing for you to understand. Standpoint theory means that you can only be aware of what you experience. See, there's no truth, so you only know what your experience is. So for example, if you're white, you're not aware of white supremacy. You're incapable of aware. You're not, not only not aware, you're not capable of aware because you don't experience it, right? You don't understand the oppression that your being exerts on somebody who's not white. So it's a, it's a good example of the postmodern philosophy behind woke ideology. Knowledge isn't based on an objective standard, but on experience. If you insist on objective knowledge, it's another example of what a white supremacist you are. Right? So it's, it's, it's rhetorically very clever, right? So I'll give them that. All right, so you guys have heard about this before. There's a book by an uh, author, uh, D'Angelo, about white fragility. What does it mean? It means if you're white, you're not even too fragile to have a conversation about your white supremacy. Uh, by conversation, of course, I don't mean a debate with differing views, right? Uh, that's not what they mean. That would simply be another example of white supremacy. Conversion, uh, excuse me, a conversation means you come to understand your white supremacy. You know, they, they explain it to you, and you uh, understand it, right? If, but if you resist it, 
Well, again, it just shows what a white supremacist is. <laughs> and I use this as an example, you know, you may have deduced this, but I'm white. <laughs> in case there was any, you know, one. But this is, uh, I use this as an example of how the woke ideology operates. It's not just about white fragility, right? So it's anything which, uh, you know, they want to attack, so. All right, so that was standpoint theory. The next element is, you know, mapping the oppression. And I just hope you can see this and appreciate this for what it is, right? Here it is. Here's the map of what oppression looks like. This is the domination line running through the middle, right? So if you're in one of these groups up top, like you're attractive, for example, or young, where's Joshua? You're oppressing me. <laughs> right? Because it has a correlative, um, you know, uh, old, right? There I am, old, right? <laughs> So, uh, but in each one of these lines, there's an oppressor group and an oppressed group. Mm -hmm. So it's not class-based anymore, it's in every relationship, because that's what postmodernism says. Right? But this was too linear, even, you know, for them. So this is uh, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw's, uh, uh, so again, there'll be a quiz later, so I hope you have uh, But. These are, so you see the numbers, and, and these are the different axes of oppression. And it's called intersectionality. Oh, wow. So, and this is a quote from her. I keep hitting the microphone, sorry. Intersectionality is a lens through which you can see where power comes and collides, where it locks and intersects, right? The intersectionality. It is an acknowledgement that everyone has their own unique experiences of discrimination and privilege, okay? So intersectionality takes that linear concept of oppression and makes it three-dimensional, right? Okay. So this has led one wag uh, to come up with the theory that oh this God. is the oppression Olympics, oh right? <laughs> so you can, you, can, you can win the Olympic Games of Oppression if you're the most oppressed, right? The, um, and of course, you know, this is tongue in cheek, but um, actually, <coughs> excuse me, it's not so far. I can use a glass of water. Thanks. Okay. So again, uh, the next step and the, and the last point and the most important part of uh, of woke ideology is identity politics. And I use this slide uh, to show, right, that there's, uh, there's still this uh, friction, thank you so much, there's this friction still between the Marxists and the, uh, the postmodernists, right? So uh, the Marxists, of course, says racism and sexism would be easier to solve once we take down capitalism. And those people, you know, they're still with us. Uh, but then the postmodernists are right. So my revolution has to wait for yours. You know? Oh, they're jealous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's true. Okay. So uh, identity politics. What is so? The, the point is, what's identity? Oh, I know. I need to do that. Well, if identity is socially constructed. Uh, the woke ideologists argue that we should embrace that identity. What does that mean? So in the past, equality of opportunity was the goal of like civil rights and the sexual liberation movements. But they argue that these only serve to support the dominant groups and their oppression. Being marginalized and oppressed is my socially constructed identity. Oh, wow. So identity politics actually began in the 70s. Uh, it had mar largely Marxist roots. But like everything else, it transitioned uh, to a postmodern basis. Okay. 
Oh, let me go back one. So they adopted the view that political struggle now meant society must affirm their marginalized and excluded identities. Right. So it's not, it's not that there has to be a place for me to succeed within society. It's that society has to embrace me in my marginalized <coughs> state. So, in my view, we're sort of back to Descartes. That's why this whole thing has just been uh, an extension of some of the uh, secular Enlightenment philosophy. Right? Because this is like the complete realization of the idea of the Kojicho. All truth emanates from me. Previously, it was based on my thinking, but now it's based on my feeling. So, that means that any notion of good or evil has to be redefined to fit the oppressive narrative. And I gave the slide away, but this is, so this is where we get the 1619 project, right, for example. In the liberal worldview, society could be reformed. In the Marxist worldview, society could be rebuilt after a revolutionary transformation. In the postmodern worldview, society is created on the basis of discrimination. Oppression is built into the wow. system. That's what uh, Nicole Hannah Jones argues in the 1619 Project. You know, I don't actually recommend it as reading, but you know, <laughs> just so you know, right? It's built into the system. Uh, you can fight power with power, but you can't tame it. So. The only thing you can do, I guess, is destroy the system. But even if you do, they're not really promising a utopian outcome. It's just more endless struggle. So we're going to look a little bit then at, at the race and gender theory based on this. Because, again, the ideology of, I mean, excuse me, the philosophy of postmodernism was one thing, but this, this is like, the ideology that's being built on that foundation. So CRT began actually as a Marxist uh, legal critique. Uh, and so these are the tenets after transitioning to postmodernism, right? Racism is entrenched, as I said, it's intersectional, uh, it's, uh, it, it has dominant narratives in education, it insists on things like Objectivity and meritocracy, colorblindness, equal opportunity. These are clear signs of oppression, right? <laughs> well, we didn't used to think so, but now we know better. So the experiential knowledge of people of color is legitimate, and we have to understand that. So the counter storytelling, it's based, it's what my experience says. Right? Okay. Well, that's that's the, the, the transition, and that's where critical race theory is now teaching. So, r radical oppression, it's just systemic. It's built into the system. Racism has been woven into the social fabric of our society, casting a blind eye, uh, or not acknowledging it will not improve things. Okay. This is... Um, this is... This is the, what the woke ideology is teaching. The same is true for gender oppression. It's systemic. So it made a turn from Marxist to postmodern. So you can see, actually, again, this is a slide they use for teaching. Uh, so the material then represents Marx, right? Marxism. Symbolic is the postmodern. <coughs> so, in the material, it's the, again the bottom slide line is the objective is uh, equality, but now the objective is difference. It means you have to embrace me in my difference, whatever. If I say I'm a pig, then you have to see me as a pig. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, if you wonder why transgenderism is so uh, such a hot issue, 
it's kind of the tip of the spear of the fight uh, of gender oppression. Right? So it's like um, if you don't fit into the one or the other, then this is the ultimate difference, right? I'm not what you think I am, what you've created me to be. So gender is a sliding scale, right? Between male and female, right? And and I mean literally, you can move along the line here. That's that's the. Uh, and again, these are not my slides. This is what is being used to teach this. Okay. So, I will argue that gender identity is the clearest attack on science and objective truth, right? It asserts that gender is socially constructed. And biology, again, not science, it's considered, the term they like to use is essentialist. Oh, wow. Which I guess means that some people think it's a fact, right? <laughs> uh, uh, but, since science is a product of the oppression of the Enlightenment, biology should not stand in the way of me expressing my own lived experience. I thought these are buzzwords that I, you know, I'm using here, but that's the ones they're using, right? I'm not, I'm not making them up. And the cutting edge, I would say, of gender theory is queer theory. Um, it is purposely deconstructive, meaning that it's designed to be subversive and to break down all distinctions. Even those previously considered untouchable, right? I mean, they argue, I mean, the, 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 the homosexual community has long argued that uh, it's a biological fact, right? It's innate. But since they don't believe in biology and they don't believe in biological innateness, they argue that they reject this as more biological, essentially. So it's. As I say, this is the cutting edge. Uh, I, and I would say the pinnacle of woke ideology, it's an attack on the core of human identity. And uh, recently, this last week, even the Pope is rejecting it as a great threat to human dignity. And again, I'm not, I'm not Catholic, I'm not promoting that, that but, uh, but that's his... Uh, his observation. Uh, so, wow. these are the elements of the woke ideology. What is the agenda then? Right? Well, as we know, the stated goal of the woke agenda is DEI. And it sounds nice. You know, liberty, equality, brotherhood, that all sounds really good. Right? Peace, land, and bread. Anybody here against that? No, right? The revolution promises systemic change, right? To dismantle the system in the name of DEI. So this is a frequent, you may have seen this image before, if not, this is frequently used to sort of show what equity really looks like. And equity really is the core of DEI. Um, so equity means we all have an equal outcome. So it, I mean, and it looks so benign, you know, the tall guy didn't need his box, <laughs> right? So let's just take it from him and give it to the shorter guy, right? That seems fair, right? So, so Bob, you have a, a nice car, don't you? Would you like like to put the keys up here and then we'll figure out who the most deserving person <laughs> is? See, there's a very deserving person over there. And, and if we take your car and give it to her, then it'll be fair, right? It's the same. You know, I will point out, this has been tried before, people. This has been tried before. You remember the French Revolutionaries. They, they wanted to take the property from the Catholic Church and uh, distribute it, right? How'd that work out? It was all done in the name of fairness. And we can't forget uh, Martin Lassus from the Ukrainian Cheka, right? 
So this has been, again, this has been tried before, and it doesn't work, right? It just creates more civil war. So up to now, and again, we're still in the, sort of in the middle of this. It's playing out. Right? So uh, we haven't gotten to the guillotine or the Dulon yet. Uh, but the DEI has made a march through the institution. It began in academic institutions, first university, and then filtered down into K through 12. And those of you who are, have in, er, interact or worked on school boards or in schools, you know it's in, it's in all the schools. Uh, and it's also embedded in all the corporate HR programs, right? Uh, it's also the S in ESG. Have you all heard of ESG? Okay, it's the Environmental, Social, and Governance. Uh, it's like a score that they give to the corporations so, yeah. in order to, you know. So, anyway, it, it's the S <laughs> in ESG. And uh, those of you who work in government, and we have a, we have a few here, I, yeah. it's embedded in the government, right? There's all these trainings and the forced trainings, but there's also uh, laws, you know. So it's marched through the institutions already. And it currently kind of operates, this is actually a good slide, it shows you, again, now this is not, this is one by a critic, not, not by the promoters of, of it, but uh, you see the ideas of liber liberal culture, you know, our old American culture, versus uh, the current one which they, you know, which we call cancel culture, right? I call it perhaps a reign of error. Uh, hopefully that's as far as that goes. But, uh, so it operates based on cancel culture now. Right? That is, it's a way to attack enemies in a contemporary democratic culture, right? We don't live in a collapsing monarchy like the French or the Russians. Um, they don't currently have the political tools uh, to actually eliminate uh, people in mass. Uh, but, I will, I will finish with this. If the level of dysfunction continues to grow, a tipping point could be reached. Mm -hmm. If enough people become dissatisfied with the American experiment, if they make enough of an impact mm -hmm. so that people say, you know what, the whole American system is just it's systemically corrupt, racist, sexist, whatever. Mm -hmm. And you have no choice but to get rid of it, right? And uh, this would allow, potentially, a Robespierre or Lenin to arise with a solution. I'm saying it, it's not unthinkable, but it's not inevitable either. So, once again, let me go back. You've seen this slide. It's the same pattern we saw in the French and Russian Revolution. Um, history tells us, uh, you know, what happens when they gain uh, political power is that uh, enemies to justice have to be eliminated. So we need to recognize this pattern and come up with an alternative that addresses our challenges by bringing people together, recognizing each person's God given value. And with that, I will turn it over to Frank, and hopefully, he has a better story to tell. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. Welcome, Dr. Kaufman.
Thank you, David, for that enormously depressing. <laughs> um, I've worked with David for many years, and it's been a pleasure to work with Zenzer. <laughs> So uh, this concluding lecture of the day is an effort to represent a, an option past the kind of hideous dystopia that David said is a distinct possibility. And it is a distinct possibility. So I've named this uh, presentation The End of Woke Culture, A New American Future. Uh, we come to the concluding presentation of the day. We have just heard from David about the present ideological torrent driving a focused and systemic effort to dismantle America as we know it. This ideology has strategically and purposefully embedded itself in Western education at every level. Through media and childhood indoctrination, its goal to control all social institutions as left-formed college graduates fill up positions in all sectors. Gramsci and Domsky of the, of, the, uh, of the Frankfurt School called this the long march through the institutions. We also learned from David that this ideology, what is called wokeism, or we've identified as wokeism, is far more virulent and invasive than its rationalist and materialist predecessors. It is important, in my opinion, missing this fact, and this is important, that it is more virulent than its predecessors. Missing this fact damages the strength of the patriotic front line. There is a tendency to think that Marxism got knocked down in the 90s, wobbled to its feet, just beating the count, and has mounted a successful comeback using better, more effective strategies. This is not the case, as we've just heard. Part of the reason of this seminar is to make clear that we face a more difficult enemy that we cannot overcome if we do not clearly identify and understand it. The, ideolo the ideology attacking and destroying America and free societies is no longer Marxism any more than an F-35 Lightning II is a World War II P-51 Mustang. They're both planes. They both fly. They were both built for the same purpose. But it would be a mistake to go to war without knowing the difference between the two. If the metaphysical force attacking us now is hypersonic, our defense must match those capabilities. Throughout the day, we have seen the binary twin rails of choice whenever excessive injustice and human suffering drives us to want to help. One rail removes God, one rail removes, uh, renews faith. When social inequality reached a breaking point in the Enlightenment, French philosophies made God lower than human reason. This led to the French Revolution, the reign of terror. The constructive side chose religious reformation and awakening, which eventually blossomed in the birth of America and its ever-growing freedom and equality. Later, when social inequality reached an intolerable extremes from the Industrial Revolution, options were similar. Marxists made matter higher than both God and humans. This produced violence, tyranny, mass death, and incarceration. Those on the faith and reform side created a century of remarkable progress in race, gender, and economic equality. The prosperity of free societies eventually crushed communism, both as a theory and politically, through the involvement of faith-affirming world leaders, such as Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, Pope John Paul II, Lech Lesser, and others. Today, a certain cadre of radical and progressive intellectuals still cling to Marxism, often from the comfort 
of their multi-million dollar homes near Harvard Yard and their corrupt not-for-profit scams. But the philosophical avant-garde, Marxism is essentially defunct. David accurately described our times as post-atheist. The current divide and attack from the left is far more complete and more serious than earlier revolutions. What is now removed from the human experience is not God, the object of faith, but it is now a concerted effort and effective removal of meaning, order, and even language itself. The force of total obliteration fuels race and gender hatred everywhere and all the time. Anyone who tries to point out this horror, as David pointed out, is framed as consumed with hate. Woke power has its laser focus on the means by which to silence the righteous. The success of the progressive left to remove truth and replace it with subjective experience is the final weapon of division. It brings us to the total silencing of dissent by all and every means. This is the DNA of today's revolution. It is not Marxism. It is not an economic theory. It forbids thinking and speaking. It forbids dissent. Oh, this is, um, oh, by the way, we're lucky that we're even in America still because something very close to the destruction of our country happened not so long ago, yeah. as many of you can see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That Pearl Harbor? Yeah. Yes, uh, a little worse. A little worse than Pearl Harbor. <laughs> 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 I'm just trying to get my bearings. <laughs> I must say humbly that the current conservative habit of constantly pointing out hypocrisy on the left is futile. It causes us to lose time and come closer to losing our country. We are spending too much time on social media, talking to ourselves, arguing with insignificant strangers, and not enough time winning. We love Tucker, Bannon, Tim Pool, Jordan Peterson, but liberals are not spending all their time online listening to George Soros or Jeff Zuckerberg all day. The left is following long-term, carefully crafted, strategic, devious strategies and effectively destroying our justice system and the possibility of fair elections. This is a very big difference. As critical theory is perfected and hermetically sealed against arguments and challenges, it offers nothing to improve human life, as David pointed out, but it is perfect at destroying. It, the only thing it does is divide, deny, undo, break things down, disallow speech, and in the end, critical theory turns against itself. It's self-devouring. Self it's not like a flesh-eating virus, it's like a self-eating virus. It cannot be engaged, it cannot be debated. That you argue, as David pointed out, is proof that you are the oppressor and must be removed. Speaking itself is oppression. Unopposed, this can easily destroy America. Yeah. It will also destroy its own followers one by one, group by group. Yes. As with all God-replacing, human-diminishing revolutions, it finally produces large-scale human eradication and the arising of a power elite and a system of feudal, feudal, F-E-U-D-A-L, feudal servitude. Pure wokeism began in a tiny house of mirrors created by language philosophers lost in the sub obscure world of semiotics and meta-semantics. This inane hobby dedicated to removing meaning from writing and speaking required these thinkers to undergo convoluted contortions. You can think of this similarly to jazz snobs or modern art snobs, tiny self-important groups amazed by their own superiority in a dark club at 3 a.m. twitching to some grating noise called music, or sitting in the front row of a fashion show, fanning themselves in awe of the genius who dresses his runway models only in feces and eye makeup. <laughs> These critical theorists kept themselves busy and rich writing books and flying to international conferences. 
but the problems they faced were two. The philosophical content was the enemy of its own self. They're removing meaning from language. So itself is a self-destructive philosophical uh, undertaking. As I said, self-devouring, impossible to sustain. Its success would be simultaneously its own self-destruction. While intellectually entertaining, it was so inaccessible that it stood no chance to survive. It's like a religion with three people whose, only, whose sole tenet is celibacy. So how did this obscure philosophy rise to the menacing power it has today? How could this small self-absorbed club survive? As David just explained, radical race and gender theorists took over critical theory because race and gender hustle is built on the necessity of permanent victimhood. Thus the power grid. Critical theory was the gold at the end of the rainbow. Everything is oppression. Meet the race and gender industry, and you have a match made in heaven. This is uh, I'm, a woman, I think, I'm not sure, I'm not a scientist, okay. <laughs> In short, postmodern critical theory rose from the grave and became the per pervading ideology of division, leading the charge to destroy America with such surgical <coughs> precision that it makes Marxism look like a kid with a Nerf gun. By bringing the war of violence and vengeance into race and gender, these new fans of critical theory were able to do what Marx could not. It is not oppression from a corrupt, from corrupt, corrupt clerics and monarchs that play the best. It is not oppression from capitalists and bourgeoisie. No, it is oppression from someone born white, from someone who insists that words have meaning, from someone who suggests that punctuality is good, who says rapists in skirts should be allowed in schoolgirls' bathrooms. All the, anyone to critique any of these matters are hate. Views, any views are hate. They are all oppression. They must be destroyed, silenced, jailed, or bankrupted. Who decides? Again, as David pointed out, my feelings decide. Together with David, I hope this gives clarity to exactly what is attacking us and what is overrunning us through all institutions, including government, media, education, and corporate life. Where does this new, oh sorry, have one right after to create a pleasant, uh, I'm sorry. Where does this new and perfected form of anti-freedom, anti-America, reject God, response to social injustice fit in with the stream of binary options we've shown so far today? Acknowledge a creator, you advance towards equality and human benefit. Deny a creator, you tra travel down the path to human destruction and annihilation. Through the French Enlightenment, Revolutionaries ended up worshiping reason. The section, second rejection of God undermining physical life, a creative relationship with nature. This time it was Marx. He, Marx replaced matter, Mar, Marx placed physical matter of both, above both God and human beings. Marx undermined our God given relationship with nature and subverted our authority as a source of value. Wokeism is the full flowering of both errors. It is the complete ruination of human dignity and value. Wokeism attacks both spiritual life, as the French, and French revolutionaries did, French Enlightenment, and physical life, as the Marxist revolutionaries did. The lodestone for today's war against decent, decent and healthy societies is an organized war against identity. Spiritual, physical, mental, ment mind, body. It's, it's the completion of both threads that we studied today. 
This is wokeism. It's an attack on identity, as David pointed out. By now we know the options. We've seen them time and again. From, from the Enlightenment, faith and inner life arise from the fact that we were created by God. It is logically impossible to argue that we create ourselves. For communism, our ability to innovate, work, create, identify value comes from the fact that we are created by God, which implies the relationship with our life and or the physical world. It cannot come from the random colli collision of particles of matter. The choice at the core of meeting social revolutions is clear, and the implications of these outcomes is clear. Now we come to the bitter, bitter invasion of woke ideology. It is an attack on our whole being our inner and outer existence, in short, our identity. Woke ideology deprives us of our identity, ourselves, not just some part of us. The attack is not only total, but the enemy structure, unlike uh, France or Marx, is total. The enemies of wokeism are no longer a a selected small abusive class, a group whose actions are called oppressive, like monarchs, clerics, industrialists, or capitalists. No, we are no longer to be exterminated for what we've done. We are to be exterminated, again as David pointed out, because of how we are born. Our identity is evil. Nothing we've done. Born white, born male, born heterosexual, Denying your crime of merely existing as you were born is treated as proof of your guilt. People often compare our time to the political tyranny described in Orwell's 1984. But it is more accurate to say that we are in an existential hell captured by the har harrowing writing of Franz Kafka. The strategy and focus of wokeism is unlike the French and revolutions which were directed at oppressive political systems. The woke revolution focuses on the destruction of culture and human relations. It focuses on you personally, you individually. The source of evil in this world is how you were born. It is nothing that you've done. Despite the immense force of wokeism, the path to overcoming this evil remains as simple in its core choice. It is as it has always been and has been proven in history. Is there a creator, God, or is this simple logic replaced by something lesser? What is the true source of your origin and your identity? If that's the problem, if that's why you should be destroyed or silenced or jailed or removed is your identity, what is the source of it? Is it your color? Is it your culture? Is it the activities of your ancestors? Is it your opinion, your station in life, where you live? These are your identity. These are secondary identity uh, characteristics. By replacing the source of our identity, woke subversives permeate all of life with permanent revolution, hatred of one another, and the destruction of faith and order. The antidote is just as it has always been, is codified in the axioms at the root of our nation's founding. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created, created, equal, and endowed by uh, their creator with certain unalienable rights. Two things that are founders to risk life, fortune, and honor. The laws of nature and nature's God. Identity, identity is given to, given to each person by God. That's the origin source of your identity. That's where the war can lies now. It's, so the perfection 
of the relativism and of the woke ideology that David horrified us with. I'm going to have nightmares tonight. I'm <laughs> glad I brought my little bunny to sleep with it. <laughs> the primary characteristics of our identity is given by God to every person equally. We are free. This is our identity. We are free, we have rights, and we are equal. Why? Because we were born. And, and the woke uh, uh, relativistic uh, attack that is undermining America is your, is your problem is that you were born, is because you were born, how you were born. So to recover the stand on which we can make a stand is the exact same option once again. Our, our value is infinite, universal, and common to every person. The possibility of universal equality, universal freedom, come from the fact of our creation. If we are to have any hope in this time of threat, this axiom and basis for myself and my country is non-negotiable. This truth will ultimately end woke efforts, and div to woke efforts to divide and pit human beings against one another. The only question is this, can we do this in time to protect our country from ruin? That's the only question. Affirm, affirming a creator makes you a champion of equality and human rights. Identity politics, on the other hand, eventually pits every person against every other person, returning us to Hobbes' Leviathan in which all human, be all human existence is the permanence, and David pointed this out already, of, of a war of all against all. This is, described, uh, this is described by Hobbes that life is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. We heard this already today. Do you know what Hobbes arrived at as the only solution to this reality? the establishment of a central government. Correct? Am I correct? Sound familiar? This is why our time feels so intense and so heavy. Divisiveness is everywhere and constant. Even in our preschools, it must be thrown off totally at its root and core. Now we begin to see the picture. We see how much worse and thorough work wokeism is. Under Marxism, the people who needed to be exterminated were the bourgeoisie and the capitalist class. Marxism killed over 100 million human beings in less than 70 years, even though it identified only one small group of people as enemies. One small tiny group, bourgeoisie and capitalists. And in 70 years, managed to kill over 100 million people in the name of bringing that to pass. Imagine the extent of civilizational destruction from an ideology of violence and hatred that holds not one single person alive as having inherent value. Undermining basic order and the inherent value of our God-given identity contributes greatly with demonic greed to people willing to carve themselves up into inoperative pieces trying to destroy their own birth identity. The transsexual movement is the tip of the spear and the most violent and aggressive form of wokeism because it is an effort to create an army of people who have mutilated themselves in an effort to annihilate their own identity. These are the true believers. The wokeists are accusing you, every one of you, they're trying to destroy your identity. This movement is the, is the people who have, who have purchased this and participated in the active destruction of their own identity. That's why there's an assault on, what is it, what is it called? Sex assigned at birth or gender assigned, yeah. Because you have no identity without your gender. Without, there's, you have no identity as a woman except as a woman. And that's why this is the end of the line. The trans, okay. Um, I hope the seriousness of this battle begins to seek in and how pressing it is for believers and people of conscience to find a path beyond all small differences 
And that was the question that came up today earlier. And forge a solidarity to win this battle for survival. What can be done? Okay. This is what we've been presenting today. What is new and distinct about what we've been presenting today? First of all, the analysis. It provides a concise and total account of the historical roots of woke ideology. It draws from the history of God-denying ideologies what is radically new and unprecedented in its power to destroy, what distinguishes it from Marxism. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, no, this, is a, this doesn't respond to that question. What is sufficient in the American roots that meet and overcome Mar uh, wokeism? To affirm unconditionally and live courageously in, in our origin and our country's, uh, our country's founding, created equal, endowed by our creator with inalienable rights. This is what makes each person great, what makes America great, and what will do so forever. This is the first and foremost necessary commitment to protect and recover our country. What is sufficient in America's founding roots? Are America's founding roots alone sufficient to overcome wokeism? The ideology that we're working against is more pernicious and diabolical than anything we've ever faced. Mm -hmm. Additionally, the circumstances in which we are trying to fight this war are more challenging due to a number of issues. One, global interdependence. National sovereignty is harder to maintain under circumstances of global interdependence. We just saw the, uh, the uh, what was it, the Francis Scott Key Bridge mm -hmm. collapse. Uh, the, the, inter the interdependence of nations in the global economy, et cetera, is much more difficult to protect national sovereignty. Uh, the, the, the rise of technology to make total surveillance possible, it's, it's far more difficult to maintain personal sovereignty. The, 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 communi the, the attack on community in the age of AI, social media, and transhuman medical technology interfere with identity. These are the circumstances which, on top of the ideology being more pernicious, our environment and circumstances are more difficult. So is the mere repetition of declaring ourselves faithful to our nation's founding, is that enough now to meet the wokeism? That's the question. Because that's what I've been putting forward all day long in meeting the French Enlightenment response, in meeting the Marxist response, what in America's founding is sufficient? Oh, that's a re repeated, yeah, repeated. Okay, repeated. Okay, what, what additionally is needed under the circumstances? Here's the first point I wish to make in terms of what we're advancing in terms of a counter proposal and how we need to move forward uh, what we hope to introduce that's new and that can help your work, your organizations, and your efforts to uh, preserve and protect America. When America was founded, it was actually founded by Christians from Europe who had just spent the last century murdering each other at such enormous rates that the only reason why the Thirty Years' War ended in 1630 was because they were exhausted. They ran out, of, they couldn't kill each other anymore. <laughs> That's how the Thirty Years' War ended in 1630. These were, these were Christians, all Christians, Catholics and Protestants, uh, Catholics, uh, Protestants in the North, Catholics in the South, and they had spent, they had spent a quarter of a century murdering each other to the, to, this is in the name of Christianity. How is it how is it that those very same people could come to the United States and build the greatest, most beautiful country that ever lived? This is the providence of God. This is the power of America. This is what America did that, that 
could not happen, that could not happen in Europe. Religious intolerance, the inability to see the other as an ally, as a partner, could not be achieved in Europe. In America, it could be achieved. This is what is described in the preamble to the Constitution as a more perfect union. Something happened here that could not, in, could not happen even among Christians in Europe. That uh, image on the left is the founding of America through the mo one of the most violent collections of people. But they came in the name of faith to affirm the question I received in the morning. It was in the name of faith. It was, in the, it, was, it was not in the name of their religious religions, their religious, uh, uh, ad, uh, what is it called, Alliance, uh, uh, identities, but in their faith. It was, the Amer it was the America's ideal of surrender to the providence of God in America that created the United States. Now, the United States is no longer merely a collection of Christians or even Kirstens and Jews. It is a collection of every single people. It's been happening for 240, 250 years. The United States has become the home of people of faith of everywhere in the world for the past 300 years. So the more perfect union that, the more perfect union that, our, that our founders identified uh, in the in the declaration in the preambles of the constitution is needs a step up that is a next step in in what is needed to meet the woke ideology to to reco we have to con we have to confirm the source of our identity that is the front line that's what that's that's our um what is it, the uh, Normandy landing? That's our Normandy landing. What, are you a white guy? Are you a white guy? No. You're, 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 you're free, you're equal, you have an alienable right. You're, you're white, yeah, I, I thought I saw that, or you, present, uh, you convinced me earlier today. But, but it's not your identity. And so, and so every... every the capacity to, to insist that my identity does not match any of what the woke relativists are imposing on me is the front line. And, and, and to have a more perfect union is, to, is for America to do what it was able to do from the European uh, dis, dis, uh, uh, disorder. It has to be able to now do it on a global disorder. It, the, the, the affirmation of our bond and commitment to nature and nature's God has to be able to do, again, greater what we did once before. We're meeting the final enemy. We're in a global era. And the way to win now is, um, is to do it one more time and do it grander and better and greater. And it's difficult. It's difficult. This to do this requires that we find ways to transcend our parochial boundaries. Because retaining our parochial boundaries is participating in the energy of what the woke ideology is doing. It's participating in that. It's not, it's not um, how can I say it? It's not making a small distinction between Zim and Zer and Zay and Zer, but, but it is making a distinction between, oh, you know that joke about this guy who's going to commit suicide off a bridge, and he goes, are you a Christian? He goes, yeah. And he goes, where, what kind of Christian? Protestant or Catholic? Protestant, hey, I'm a Protestant. It goes on and on and on. He goes, are you Protestant? Are you like a Southern Baptist? Yeah, Southern Baptist. Southern, ba Southern Baptist uh, 1943 convention? No, no, uh, yeah, 1943. Southern Baptist 1943 convention, no, no musical instruments? No, no, we have a piano. Die, heretic! He kicks him off. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> that's a great joke. <laughs> so, so um, <laughs> that's what identity politics is, is turning all of us against each other. And, and what, what we, we, our insistence on being, having an identity as free, equal, 
And uh, what is it? Free, equal. <laughs> Speaking too much. Um, <laughs> bread. Okay. Yeah. Our identity must be insisted upon, and we must be able to do once again what we did once before, but greater and better and stronger. And it's going to take a lot. It's not easy. It's not easy to overcome important distinctions and boundaries, but we have to understand our commonality. The second, the second thing is that the, the guarantee of freedom in the Constitution is individual freedom, individual sovereignty. This, but when the founders, when the founders affirmed this, it was recognized and, and known that America's only possible for a moral people. It's only possible for a moral people. So individual freedom is only possible for a moral people. Otherwise, freedom will be insisted upon as the freedom to uh, publish pornography, the freedom to uh, change the gender of, of, for, of fourth grade uh, girls or boys or things like that. Individual freedom needs moral guidelines. And so the next, so I've already described one step up, which has to, there has to be an affirmation of American founding that makes us do once again what we did once before, but at a greater level, at a broader level. We have to find, somehow find the common religious devotion of my Hindu friends, of my Jain friends, of my um, shaman friends, etc. The, anyone who has the common sense to affirm the creator is the protector against the assault on identity and identity politics. The, the second thing is, the second thing is that what our founders created was individual freedom that was sufficient in an era in which, in which religious life was presumed and family life was presumed. And that's where we became a moral people, and that's why free people could create the greatest nation ever. And in the interim, the rise of science and other social factors have greatly eroded the capacity of religions to create a moral people. This room happens to be full of religious people and full of moral people, but generally in society, there the, the the power of the religious institutions to create a moral people has not been sufficient to protect a nation that radically affirms individual liberty. It's just, it's just not. Like hookup culture. Hookup culture. This, this is the nature of the, of the social environment in which our, our teenage children live. It's taken for granted. Nobody's even fighting against that. I've never even heard. A, I've never even heard a single conservative person ever go crazy about Tinder. Tinder isn't it a swipe left, swipe left, swipe right, and just sleep around, sleep. And, so, and they have competitions, see how many people they can sleep with. I don't know of any. I don't know of anybody who's putting up a fight against that. It's a. It's a. It's a they wave the white flag. So. So how do we? How do we uh, retain the genius? of the guarantee of freedom that is God-given. It's because you're born, you're free. And recover the necessity, ne necessary basis of freedom established by our founders. The response, the response is this. Freedom to do what? Freedom to do what? And this is, this is an important slide for me. I've already described that calling myself created uh, is what makes me sovereign, oh, that's the word I was looking for, sovereign, equal, and free. That's, that's why, does this have a, a pointer in it? Oh, look at that. Yeah. That's, that's why I'm free, why I'm sovereign, and, and where my identity comes from. Why, why did God grant that freedom why why did why did god make human beings free by birth why is that the nature of human identity that does not exist 
in the, in the Declaration of Independence. It does not exist in the preamble to the Constitution. It is not, it is not inherently taught. And that is the next additional step that I believe is needed now in which the conservative right and the moral crusaders and the people protecting our country w will win. The reason why God created us free is because love cannot exist unless human beings are free. You might like me, but if you had no choice, you can't say you like me. You have no choice. Freedom is the requisite for love to happen. The, so in addition to just the declaration of freedom, there has to be at this point a new American revolution, which is the purpose, freedom and purpose. The reason why God created human beings free is so that love is possible. That, that is just a matter of logic. It's not a declaration of faith. It's not a religious tenet. It's a logical thing. Love is not possible unless someone is free to, to create it. Otherwise, it's just robotics. It's just, uh, or threats, or fear, or something like that. That's why, that's why megalomaniacs uh, struggle, because they can't get anybody to love them. All they can do is threaten them with fear. The purpose, the, what the founders ident knew is that human beings were being free, but they never introduced that, that the, the purpose of freedom. And the purpose of freedom is that you're capable of loving. What does love do? What does love do? It creates families. Love creates families. And, and this is the way to retain this is the way to retain the genius and vision of our founders and to reintroduce the guardrails in which freedom, before we had the guardrails of a, of a basically religious society, a moral people. <coughs> Family is the guardrails of the, that contradicts the, the, the statement, I'm free to do anything. I'm not, you know, I, I can, you know, I was telling, who was I telling the other night? I said, there's, there's two people that amaze me, black mothers and Irish wives. You know, because you'll have this, you'll have this eight foot tall black guy, all muscle, threatening someone, and his little old mom comes out, says, James, get yourself in the house, get yourself in the house. And it's like, boom, he turns around, it's like, I don't know how it happens, I don't know how it happens. And the Irish wives, you'll have, this, you'll have this guy that goes out to the club every night, or to the pub every night, his purpose is to get into a fight. His purpose is to get into a fight. And the bartender will call and say, he says, Shireen, you know, Jack, Jack's had a little bit too much tonight. And she, she walks three blocks, there's, all, there's these barbarians in there drinking it up, and she'll say, Jimmy, where are you? Get yourself inside. And this big muscular guy walks home. There's something about family. I'm not trying to be, uh, 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 I'm already in the, in the, in the uh, uh, <laughs> woke jailhouse now, I'm for sure. But there's something about family that, that itself already blocks this notion of individual freedom. No one genuinely has individual freedom if you're in a family. Because you got brothers and sisters, you got a mom and dad, you got children. There's a there's a version of freedom that, but once you have family, it it provides the guardrails of a moral people. It emulates a moral people, and so the purpose of the the reason why the the founders identify that free, freedom and equality are are are. Um, uh, in unalienable God-given, God-given rights, is be is because the design the design of the expansion of human society is meant to follow along the lines of freedom. It's meant to follow along the lines of love. So my family then, be, the first the the first social the first social unit is the family. Um, I, I now I have obligations here. 
I'm a member of society. I can't go out and spend all the money. Somebody's going to go hungry. The next, the next size of social unit is a church or club. It's the, first, it's the first larger thing that doesn't have blood relatives in it. It's people I care about, people I take care of, people I'm obligated to, that uh, I don't, they're not my blood relatives. And then the next larger thing is district or county or, or parish or whatever it is. These are people I don't even know. It's because of where I live. And so this is the first, this is the first, they're not, they're people I don't even know. But, but if it's expanding through the origin of my, of my identity as being born of God, or being born at all, then the expansion of the, even the nation reflects God. And so the, so the, so the final thing I, I would like to point out is, A, yes, a repetition. The twin rails, the, the on-off switch, the binary, created or something other than God. God or something other than God. And the God part, to me, is like, it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not preaching. It's logic. Tell me anything that's created itself. That, to, it's, I'm not putting religion on you. I'm asking you to answer a simple question, a piece of logic. And, but once you've identified that I'm created, then you look to other, other uh, texts and then say we're created with inalienable rights. We're created free and, uh, free and equal. And this is a stand against identity politics. This is a stand against a pernicious direction of the radical relativism which David haunted us with uh, a little while ago. Created. Second, uh, so, and then a more perfect union. I've asked Americans, and I'm asking all of us here, to add into our, uh, into our fight, into our work, into our organizations. Please add an encouragement or, or help Americans to have a next revolution, the same kind of revolution that allowed America to be a place where Christians stopped murdering each other all the time. And now we're bigger than that. We're filled with everybody. And so we need an even greater capacity to start to embrace an even greater and wider form of cultural affirmation, of spiritual affirmation, of religious affirmation, and things like that. And that, that will take care of that side of things. And then one additional thing, uh, created by God to be free and equal, why? Why? The purpose God founded America. The purpose I'm created free. There's only one reason to be free. It's not to publish pornography. Or it's not to, it's not to go drink beer at the ball game every single night of the week. Or something. The reason to be free is so that you're capable of love. And love produces families. And once, once we recover the purpose for American life and the perf purpose for birth, and recognize that we're extending the sovereignty God gave me into the first social unit that exists, family. Then we're on, then we're on track. Then we're on track to recover our country. Uh, I, will, I have another list, like I showed you, of all, the, of all the people who continue to drive the greater equality among sex, uh, races and genders and things like that but I'd rather conclude with I'd rather conclude with these two small this one repeated affirmation and these two small additions that I think will help the the contemporary conservative front line okay the the, the repeated one the binary are you created or not the extra one a, a more perfect union do it again. Let's do it again. Let's do it one more time. Let's do it bigger. And there will, there will be no stopping us. That's the great work of David Hernandez. Uh, 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 Her uh, Hernandez, do I get it right? Yeah, yeah. He, it's like there's nobody outside. There's, there's no longer uh, uh, one kind of group anymore. Everybody is in there in the realm of common sense. And then the, the next little addition not only just demand my sovereignty, born free, you know, created free, live free or die. Why? Why? That's again another piece of logic. 
It's not a hallmark card, love. It's a piece of logic. The reason, you can't love without being free. And everybody, that's what you want. And what love does is create families, and families creates the protection of the moral individual. It makes us moral somehow. Even the worst of us, it makes us moral somehow. And uh, this is a new American revolution. This is enough. I believe this is enough. And uh, with all of you, all of your genius, all of your capacity, all of your knowledge that's better than mine or David's in, in your particular areas, please bring them in. Please help this grow. Please add ways to make this teaching work. I think, I'm, I'm serious, a, a, a rebirth of America, a new revolution is needed with just a couple of added things because of the nature of the time, not because of our founders had any thing lacking. All right, thank you. I conclude with that. Let's have one last round of applause for both David and Kevin. Okay, we're almost done. Can you hang in there a couple more minutes? Can you hang in there a couple more minutes? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, another um, important representative of the settlement project has a few concluding remarks to make. I want to invite him up, Mr. Bob Spitz. So is a, a, a resident here in Orange County, has a law office, Spitz, attorney at law, and I'd like to welcome Bob to say a few final words. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Kaufman and Dr. Burgess, for those amazing presentations today. I think everybody could realize that this is a battle for America. We are at war today with an ideology, an ideology that seeks to destroy everything you and I stand for, everything that has been built up for this nation to be God's nation, one nation under God. They facing today, and as uh, Dr. Kaufman has pointed out, we want to strive for a more perfect union. America was founded upon certain values. We have to perfect those values today in order to resist and overcome the ideology that we're fighting against. What is ideology? It's ideas plus action. So on our side, we have to have ideas plus action. And we're so thankful to have so many political people here today who have put their ideas into action to make their city and the state a better nation. This ideology for action needs to be spread throughout this United States. And so we are putting on programs, not just here in California, but throughout the nation. If you happen to be in an organization that has a nationwide reach, uh, please contact a uh, 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 settlement project to find out where there might be other uh, programs and events like this where, where you might be able to bring more people to come to understand because it's an ideology that has to be transforming into action. So the more people that understand it, the more action we have, the better we can accomplish the goal that we have uh, today. So this event, uh, we're very happy and grateful that Epic Times has been filming this event today, so there's going to be a historical record from the Epic Times, the greatest newspaper in America today, after the Washington Times, which I helped to found, but that's another story. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's being filmed. That will be available. You, you can contact us to, to find out how you can get connected to the Epic Times in this, uh, this videotape, because we can just, you can just play this. This is a, a, a program that you can then play to other people so they can come to the same understanding. The next thing I want to make sure you understand is we want to duplicate this event as many times as we can. If you have an organization and you have people that you want to hear this, we want to help you. We want to put on that program. You just contact Settlement Project, sp12.org on the Internet, 
We will help you create another program just like this. We can either train your people or we can bring our people here to put on a similar event with, with your church, your organization, your, your situation, whatever it might be. We need to get this understanding out. This is the f- battle for the sake of our future, for your children, your grandchildren. If we don't win this battle, you see what, what can happen. The French Revolution, the Communist Revolution. This ideology that the left has is more pernicious than any of those ideologies, and the result can be even worse. They don't care about your God-given creation. You are just an object. You are just an object. They don't care about your divinity, your God creation. You're just another individual that if you don't go along with what they believe and you don't support what they believe, you don't exist. And your existence should not continue. So that's what we're about. So there's two things I want you to see if you can help us with. One is to expand this program and to further it in other places and more times. And the second way, if you don't have that kind of an organization, if you'd like to contribute to our organization. We are are just a grassroots, just getting started, the small group of six of us here in California and our own contributions, that's all that it's taken so far to put on this program. If you can expand that, if you can help contribute to us or contribute to your own organization to put this program on, the contributions will go a long way. We, we operate on a shoestring budget. We don't spend a lot of money doing what we do. So to the extent you can contribute or you can help us financially, that will help this grow. We want to reach as many people as possible. There's a there's an election coming up in November that is all important for this nation. Not only do we need to win that election, we have to go forward. We can't just stop in November. November is not the end. November is the beginning of a new America. If we can reach with this ideology, a new kind of society where every every individual, every every person can understand that this is true. We're talking about truth. There is not relative truth. There is not gender identity. There is God's creation, God's truth. Not there, no truth. What they have is not truth. It's not real. What we have is the truth. We share this, everything you've heard today. I think 100% we agree upon these ideas. This is what America is all about. This is what those people came in faith on small little boats and across the Atlantic Ocean to come to establish. Now we want to perfect that union that God brought America to exist for this purpose, for you living today, to you fulfill the goal that God created America for. Please help us, contribute financially, contribute with organizations, and let's get the truth out so more people will stand with us and create a new America. Thank you. Give one another a big round of applause for being here. We are going to finish with just a closing prayer, um, in very short closing prayer. Let's thank the Settlement Project one more time. Let's give a round of applause because the revolution has started, but the information we get here is something that we can take out because the battle has begun. Um, I just want to give a shout out before I close in prayer. We have the Turning Point USA students here. They're, they've come, listen to this whole thing. If you have a child or a grandchild that's in high school and college, go back to the table back there and, and get their information. Get them plugged into the schools because the fact is that the battleground, as much as we see it on our streets, it's more intense and more critical that we get the students and the young people involved. So let's close in prayer. Lord God, we just thank you and praise you, God, that we, you have blessed us to live in the the greatest nation on the face of this earth, Father God. We thank you, Father, for rising up your people that call you by your name, 
to fight this battle that's before us, Father God. Allow us to be ambassadors for this word, this message. Allow us to stand for the principles that we have been for so blessed to have as our foundation, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, Father God. We ask, Father God, that you inform us. Allow us to go out there and be courageous and strong. Allow us never to turn back, Father, and we just give you all the praise. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.